if you are school personnel. Okay, school personnel. What particularly? Uh, Councilor Glenbarger. Councilor Glenbarger, yeah. thank you very much. You are, I see you've met before. Entire school of psychology. Katie, oh, Katie, come up here. You can say hi to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and Susan is a parent, and you're a parent. Very good. Thank you. Noon is up, and you are a parent as well. How old is your child? <laughs> Elementary school. And what level are you? Elementary. Elementary two. Okay. So you have the whole wide spectrum. So Cindy, mm -hmm. say hi to everybody. Hello. Kate for helping support the Glenbard Parent Day. We really appreciate it. A couple of projects we have coming up again that we that we're partnering on. We've got a program on Saturday on everything you need to know about the college admissions process, Spanish and English at the Glenbard South at 1030 on Saturday. And then the next program after that is going to be with Dr. Ken Ginsburg. He's doing a noon presentation at Marshall School on Wednesday. He's a great speaker on resilience. And then the night before, on the 17th of November, he'll be talking at the College of DuPage, the 7 p.m. at the National Arts Center. Also coming up, Mark Brackett <laughs> is our next speaker after that, doing an all-day institute for Kate. Mark is the director of the Social and Emotional Learning Program at Yale University. He'll be doing an evening program, the second, and an all-day Kate all on the third. Um, So this is a topic very near and dear to my heart, and we were really, really lucky today that we have two experts in the field. And because we're small, I know you'll want us to just probably, well, you'll, you'll explain how you want to handle it. But um, <coughs> we're really excited about having John Dominguez come. John has recently become the clinical director of Arlen School mm -hmm. in Winnetka, um, a school of 40, um, which he'll probably tell you more about it. And um, thank you so much for coming to this important topic we're unveiling, a paradigm shift. Thank you. All right. <coughs> so yeah, I'm used to speaking to larger groups. If I am yell too loud, quiet me down. Um, the good news is um, when I speak to much larger groups, um, sometimes um, as I'm just going through the material, it's more of a lecture than a discussion, um, just in the nature of it. So we can, we have, um, we have an ample amount of time. I've been able to crunch this, this presentation before into 90 minutes. It's been a stretch. So I think we have till 2.30. Is that what the schedule is? Um, or, less. or less. So 2, 2.15, two whatever. Um, if I see you guys getting bored, we'll speed it up. <laughs> um, but uh, I won't have to rush. And um, because it's so small, I've always kind of wished that some of the talks I do can be smaller because Sometimes the energy in the room is to have, a, have more of just a dialogue um, and not have to sort of wait for me to get through all the slides and say all the stuff and then hope to get a question in later. And I find that at the end of the, at the, end of the talk when it's over, people are kind of trying to flag, flag me down and, you know, that's, you know, nobody, that just doesn't work very well for, for anyone. So, um, so I want to take advantage of the small group. Um, you guys don't have to move any closer. I would be sitting towards the back probably too if I were you guys <laughs> for most things I go to. But um, uh, I'm going to be free to um, have this be more of a panel. It's set up to be a lecture presentation, um, um, somewhat interactive, but we have the opportunity and the time to be way more interactive. So definitely feel free to um, stop me, slow me down. Um, so uh, let me give you... <coughs> um, a little, um, a little sort of the trailer of this talk. Um, where I became, um, uh, and I'll, I'll go over the history a little bit, but 
Um, I've been a lot more since graduate school. I've been, I've been, I've been in practice um, in the school system. I have not been, um, I've not been in an academic institution um, or a research lab or, or or that. So I want you guys to um, know that. But um, where this topic, this bullying topic, which has gotten so much attention in the last 20 years, um, there has been um, a there's been a disconnect, as there often is, between what's happening research theory and practice. And I think everybody kind of understands how that how that can go. Um, so what I'm bringing to this topic um, is more of a service-based um, approach. Um, the knowledge that I have, um, as much as I follow the literature and as much as I've done my own research on this topic, um, this is developed from millions of hours working with kids in the school system and swinging and missing at trying to stop this problem. So, <coughs> um, so that's kind of, um, uh, that's kind of uh, a, a little bit of background. Um, the other part, just to, just to do the preview, is the paradigm shift, which is a subtitle of this um, presentation, is I put it in the title because th I want you guys to start thinking about this differently. I'm going to walk you guys through this, but um, myself and, and other so-called experts in this field have been approaching the bullying problem in schools and other ways in, in pretty pretty defined, sensible ways without um, the kind of meaningful um, effectiveness that we've wanted. Um, and as I'll come to talk about, um, I, think I've, I think I stumbled across um, uh, a paradigm shift. I think I changed the paradigm. And after doing so, um, a, lot, a lot of things were made more clear about how to address this problem. And it identified ways um, the ways in which we were coming up short um, in the past. And I'll walk you guys through all that, but I want to prepare you for this paradigm shift that um, at the risk of sounding arrogant, I promise you in five and 10 years that people are going to be talking and doing research on exactly what you're going to hear about today. Um, uh, I'm, not an, I'm a child psychologist, but I'm not an expert in every area of child psychology. But this is one thing that um, what I'm telling you today is, is fresh and um, uh, it's the direction that this is going to go. I've already seen it uh, in the law. I've already seen it in the media. They're catching on a lot later. But um, so <coughs> if you allow me that little bit of arrogance to say this is, I think this is right, um, humor me and, and, and just and can s think about it as we go through. Um, so I started graduate school in the mid-90s. Um, <coughs> and I went to... <coughs> I went to a clinical psych doctorate program that was uh, um, child and family centered, and one of their <coughs> one of the one of the areas that this place was known for was they had um, uh, they were doing a lot of of research on uh, child abuse, um, physical and sexual child abuse. There was a, there was a clinic there. Um, and they had, you know, you had three or four guys that were at the top of the field in terms of doing um, research on the effects of physical sexual abuse, um, uh, marital conflict on child adjustment. <coughs> so I was lucky enough to be um, thrust into that learning environment. One of the interesting things about the, the Victims Resource Institute, which was at the on school, which was at the at school clinic, is they also, somebody earlier, it wasn't me, it wasn't, I wasn't bright enough to do this, but somebody before I got there had, had said, what if we extend our, um, our services and treatment and research to a different population of, <coughs> of victims, bully victims? Because, you know, in the schools and all around there, every school is saying this is a problem we can't get our hands on. You know, 20% of all parents are saying my kid's afraid to go to school. Like, it's, it's a terrible, terrible problem. And, and prior to me getting there, um, the, my, my research group um, ha was doing groups and taking data on kids who were identified as <coughs> chronic victims of bullying. They were identified by parents and by staff, from by teachers. And so we were, it started with us just doing sort of like social skills and assertiveness training kind of thing to them. But the data that 
that was um, the data that it yielded was extremely interesting. What they were finding was that these kids, in terms of adjustment, these kids that were uh, getting bullied at school on frequently, they were looking the they were looking really, really, really similar to kids who were um, who'd been through physical and sexual abuse, and we it raised it certainly opened our eyes in terms of how significant this was. So I walked into that sort of um, I worked into that research group, and I got really fascinated with um, with bullying prevention. That was going to be my my, my little niche in child psychology. Right as a as a as a graduate student, I wanted to. I wanted to um, become an expert, and so I, you know, I spent a lot of time staying on top of the research and doing all this, and this is exactly what I wanted to do. In 1995, um, if I go back, let me go back earlier. Um, 1995 was was good for me because um, was good for this area of research because it was only 10 years earlier that um, the notion of um, you know, bullying is just kind of something that happens and it's just part of growing up and kids just need to figure out a way to deal with it. I mean, this is kind of how it was when I was growing up. Um, if, we were, if we were bold enough to tell our parents that we were getting bullied, you know, because we would be embarrassed if our, I would be embarrassed to tell my dad that some kid bullied me because he'd wonder why I didn't punch him in the face. All those, all those cliches that you've kind of all heard about. The 80s, the myths were starting to be broken a little bit um, in, in popular culture. Um, because research had, had finally um, gotten information to the general public that this problem has some long, short and long-term effects that we probably need to look at and, um, and we probably need to do something about. We can't be comfortable that bullying runs so rampant in every single school in this country. Um, what they were doing is they were tying in um, uh, being b being bullied as a kid with a lot of psychosocial adjustment problems in middle school, um, in terms of d anxiety, depression, relationship building, even into even into high school and young adulthood, um, that self esteem issues, again long standing relationship issues, um, anxiety, um, and the research as as best as it could was linking it to um, being chronically bullied. So. The 80s was the time where we were looking this at we were looking at this as a clinical problem, okay, not just something that we just need to. It's like a rite of passage in, in growing up. Um, so, um, I was um, I was a beneficiary then of, you know, being able to do being able to have a, have a lot of research at my disposal to start thinking about this. So, the time was ripe for for us to make a lot of movement. Um, in the area of bullying prevention. I can remember that time feeling like, you know, in five years, we're not going to be, no one's going to be talking about bullying anymore because we're doing such good research on it. We're taking it seriously now. Um, I was totally wrong, and I'll, I'll tell you why I think I was wrong later. But, um, so, but a lot of people were paying attention now to the problem. And this increased um, through the 90s, and then it exploded in April of 1999 with Columbine because <coughs> the, the media linked Columbine to bullying. Um, that was, to me, that was oversimplistic and actually a little distorted. These kids, um, these kids were, these kids had a lot of, these kids had a lot of psychiatric issues. Um, but I did not care that the media convinced the world that this was this was this was what happens when kids get bullied and you don't do anything about it, because now um, we had all the research and all the popular attention on it. And the reason why that was good for somebody like someone like me was uh, people wanted to hear more about this topic. That we didn't have to push this topic onto people. We felt like we had a lot to say, but we were we were turning away people who wanted to know more about this. It's not like we were trying to see if anybody wanted to hear what we had to say. So. So um, I've been doing these talks for, um, for years, um, uh, and the last half of which um, I actually have something to say of value uh, before, and I'll tell you why. A um, little bit of value, some, uh, some mis misguiding, and some actual disservice, and I'll talk to you about that. Um, but so this research was, um <coughs> it was plentiful, and it was productive. Some of the things that came out of this research in the early 90s was stuff that 
it even should have been a no-brainer back then, and it probably was, but things like bullying happens most often at bus stops, playgrounds, and lunchrooms where, this, where there's not as much adult supervision and structure. Okay, that should have been a no-brainer. We don't need a doctor, we don't need a, a PhD to tell us that. But, but things like this were just getting into the mainstream and every school wanted to do something, uh, something about it. So um, we talked about um, the incidence of bullying. We talked about the definition of bullying. We wanted to raise awareness and this was really, really, really hot. Um, and um, people were just soaking this stuff up. And um, we had, um, we, we talked about, um, we learned about what development has to do with bullying, um, which is worth saying now in, in that um, there's a reason why bullying peaks towards the end of elementary. Um, it rises through, ele through early elementary. It peaks right around the middle of middle school and then, and then it starts to decrease a little bit. Um, uh, into high school and certainly later in high school and there are, develop there are developmental reasons for that. Um, it is right about that time, seven, eight, and nine, where um, developmentally kids <coughs> have figured out that what they do and say can manipulate other people's reality. It, it's when they learn how to lie. lie, lie constructively. I know that a fourth grader can say, know when his dad asked did you eat the last cookie when he knows he did he's just avoiding punishment but in terms of constructing a different reality for someone through what you say and what you do two years ago like when they're first second third grade they don't really know that they can do that so the fourth and fifth grade kids developmentally now know that i can tell you one thing and um you know i can create another reality i can manipulate what other people think and believe by what i say and what i do um they're and they're they're trying to flex this muscle, they're trying to, trying to get these, they're trying to um, hone these skills. They wanna, they wanna take them out for a spin, they wanna, they wanna learn about it. This is when kids do a lot of lying, lying that doesn't make any sense. I don't know if you ever have, if anyone has a third or fourth, fifth grader, sometimes they lie and you're like, what makes you think that I would ever <laughs> believe that? Like, what do you, like, so they're, they're kind of testing it out, but they're really not that good at it. They get better at it uh, in middle school um, just because, just out of practice, and of course the other thing, the other major thing that happens in middle school, which is why this peaks, it's not just the developmental piece, that's, that speaks to it a little bit, but um, what happens in um, middle school is a couple things, and I have an 11 year old daughter, and there's another piece of this that I don't talk about, but I'm gonna talk about it now, because this is a bigger deal than, than I even thought. So, middle school is, kids transition from a smaller school to a bigger school, okay? So now there's even a bigger demand on having some sort of social group, social connection. So that's, that's issue number one. Issue number two is this is about the time that a lot of kids are getting cell phones now, okay? So, um, uh, so they, they're just, they just happen to be more social. There are ways that they can be more social. And I knew that those two things were, were, were a problem in terms of and potential bullying stuff, that kids are a little bit freer and have a little more access. Here's the other thing that I found out the hard way that I'm gonna include in this talk every time now that my daughter's turned 11. Um, the other shift that happens um, is prior to this year with my daughter, um, when she wanted to, she doesn't wanna call it a play date anymore, but when she wanted to hang out with a friend, the parents were coordinating that. Parents were the ones, you know, third, fourth grade, Parents, certainly before then, parents are the ones that are coordinating with the other parents. Can Billy play with Johnny? Can they, and, and, um, and that's just kind of how it goes. The, wh where that's significant, of course, is most parents, not all, uh, but most parents are pretty discreet and they're pretty, they have good judgment about <laughs> not being manipulative and exclusive and mean as they, when they determine who they want to have play date, who, who they want to have play dates with their kids for. That's not all true. I live in the North Shore and it's not, it's not all true, but for the most part, if parents are the ones making these decisions, we don't run into the same amount of problems. What's going on with my sister, who's my, my daughter, who is um, really kind and really healthy, is as she's creating her own, as she's setting up her own, let's hang out here and let, hey, let's hang out there, where, when daddy's like, sure, go ahead, she doesn't know how to do it without 
she's, she's, she's injuring the feelings of her friends without even trying, and she has no idea what she's done. These kids, they don't have the skills to be able to sufficiently consider how their social decisions impact other people. It's not even of interest, and even if it was of interest, because you're, you're protecting your own interests at this age for the most part, and that's normal, but even if they were interested in what other people were thinking and feeling as much as they needed to, they still wouldn't know what to do. I'm going through um, my daughter's texts, with permission of course, I don't like to snoop like that, and I'm, and I'm saying, how do you not know that she was gonna be upset with you by you saying that? And all she could focus on was I didn't mean to say it, and I had another, I, I, there was another reason why I said it, and I didn't mean it the way she took it, so I'm innocent. And, and she's an extremely bright 11-year-old who's in all gifted classes and off the charts and all this stuff, and she couldn't make the connection. My intent wasn't bad. I have an alternative explanation. Leave me alone. I didn't do anything wrong. Um, and this is not an oppositional kid. She just didn't get it. So. I had to, I had to spoon feed that connection. I, first of all, I had to wait until, <laughs> until the smoke cleared so I could have a conversation with her without her being reactive. But I had to spoon feed that connection to her. And this is a, this is a very high functioning sixth, sixth grader. So the, the, what happens at this, with this drastic peak in, in uh, early middle school has a lot of teeth to it. And there's a lot of reason why this happens. So we'll get back to to some of that. And I'm not saying that concerning behaviors don't happen in kindergarten and first grade and second grade, but when I talk about, when I, when I define bullying, which I will say probably more than once in this talk, this talk is not about bullying. I haven't, I haven't talked about bullying, um, I haven't given a presentation that the topic was bullying in about eight years. People that ask me to speak want me to put bullying in the topic because that's what people want to hear about. This is not. This topic is not about bullying, and I'll explain. I'll explain that as I go. First graders, second graders, yeah, they they can be mean, and they can push each other out of line, and they can take what's not theirs, and they can say mean things, and um, technically that's bullying. Okay, um, and I'll I'll put this all into perspective. What the kind the developmental thing that I'm talking about is kids actively constructing. Um, a false reality just to promote themselves without any regard for hurting other people. That's a skill that you can't even put together until you're a, a, a normally developing fourth or fifth grader, okay? Maybe third if you're, if you're off the charts. Um, so the developmental stuff I thought was, was, uh, um, was useful, and it still is as I'm, as I'm teaching. Um, the other thing we spent a lot of time on, and I thought we got a lot of interesting information, too bad we can't put it to use at all, as you'll see later, is we got a ton of information on bully and victim characteristics. And we were loving ourselves for coming up with this information. We, we defined, um, I say we, this is everybody who's, who's doing research and practice in the area of bullying, okay, and following the research and trying to make some sense of it. We realized there were two types of bullies and that this was an important distinction because our, our, the way we responded was gonna be different, and it's true. That we, we said there's a reactive bully and there's an instrumental bully. And the instrumental bully um, is the garden variety bully. He's the guy, the, he's the big guy who shakes the nerd down in the lunchroom for his lunch money and kind of rules the school by fear. He's the guy who bullies instrumentally for a purpose. To, to gain status, to keep status, and, and we were noticing, we th again, we thought this was a great distinction, but it um, turned out to be not that significant. But there was a distinction between another type of bully. There's other kids who say mean things and who try to exploit people and who try to step over people to, to promote themselves, but we call them reactive bullies because they only act like that when they feel attacked or when they're provoked. They do it when they feel like someone's coming to them, and then you see a lot of bullying type of commentary coming out of their mouth, which is different from somebody who, by design, calculates and decides how they're going to initiate and maintain their power in a school building, okay? Um, these are still important distinctions because we deal with this different clinically, but we thought we were about to crack the case here. We also found that there are two different types of bullies, I mean victims as well. And again, one is the garden variety, the meek, atypical looking, quiet um, kid without a, lot of, without a lot of social status, kid that you know just walks around with a target on their head, 
Um, there's definitely that victim, but there's also this other victim that, that gets targeted a lot, but, but they too can be hostile towards other people. Okay, so, um, and these are two very different groups of kids. What we then came to find out and thought we were really close to cracking the clay is we found out that the reactive bullies and the reactive victims were the same group. Okay, that we, we knew this, but we didn't know how to talk about it. We knew that some kids, the kids who bully are kids who get bullied in other, you know, they bully over here. Like, is that me? Is that me? Um, we, uh, we get bullied, you know, the kids who bully over here only do it because they get bullied over here, whether it's at home or by their older brother or whatever. And people like me love thinking like that. In fact, um, well, I'll, I'll get to this later, but I was, I was the guy who was infatuated with the bully. Okay, I was the one who was saying, bullies are people too. They just have anger management and empathy problems, and we need, to, we need to treat them with as much sensitivity and consideration as the victims, especially when, in most of these households, they're getting their asses kicked by their dad at home, so let's just show them a little respect, okay? Um, I was a little right, but I was mostly wrong on that, and you know, all this is gonna come together. Um, so, <clears throat> I also talked about expanding awareness about bullying, and I spent a lot of time doing this, and, um, this wonderful teacher who was just really frustrated with, with my talk at one point, just, she just kind of blurted out a, an irritated comment. And, it, and it, it stuck with me because this was another person that, that without even really knowing it, was just poking holes in, in, in my approach to the problem. So what I was doing at the time, and I know what I'm talking about now with regard to this, what I was doing at the time is I was working with schools that were saying bullying doesn't happen at our school. <coughs> or it only happens <coughs> very rarely. Only a couple kids. You know, and if you just, and if the parents would say, if you just got those two kids out of there, there'd be no bullying going on. That is such a crock. Th those, you know, th those heads would grow back as fast as, as anything else. But so I was fighting against, I was trying to convince people that bullying exists. Because I had to raise the awareness before they would like treat it as a problem. So I started talking about the wide range of bullying. The continuum of bullying behavior is very wide. It's not just, you know, the wedgie and the throwing the, putting the kid's face in the toilet. It's, it's, it's all the stuff, it's all the stuff a little more, a little less subtle than that, all the way down to just inviting three people to a party and not even addressing the fourth person. It's that, that kind of subtle exclusion, gossip. Don't get me started on everything in between now that there's social media. So I was making people aware of this long continuum of bullying behavior. And I thought that this was really important to say, and actually it was. It was really important to say, but I wasn't really sure how to talk about it. And this one teacher just kind of said something to the effect of, pretty much you just said everything that kids are doing is bully. I, so how can I, you pretty much, you pro, I made the problem so big by how I was defining, she felt overwhelmed. Even, because even, even the good kids in her class do some of this stuff. I convinced that, hey, the subtle stuff hurts just as bad, but she's frustrated. She's like, now what the hell do I do? I, you tell me, I can't, uh, I can't call this kid a bully. This kid's not a bully. This isn't, you know, and she, we had a great conversation about it, but I, I held to my guns there, which weren't, very, weren't, weren't loaded <laughs> at the time. And I was just trying to convince her that these behaviors also hurt, which is kind of true, but, but it, the, we created such a big problem that it felt like we were going backwards. People that were really trying to address it with kids in school, it was harder, harder to even know where to start. Okay, so, so that's where we're at. Oh, we have all this information and people like me throwing it out, but the people, who, the, the people who are serving kids in school settings and other settings don't feel like they're much closer to the problem, okay? Feels like they have more knowledge, but give me something I can apply. Give me something that I can use, right? Um, so um, quickly again, um, it wasn't for nothing. Um, that research did, I, ta I talked about, we learned how to be more responsible monitors of, of bullying, put the, some of the supervision in the right places. Um, this research also um, got us thinking about what types of supports to give to bullies and victims. This stuff is still used today and thought about today, so this was, this was valuable. Um, 
there was very little, um, one of the things that I knew early on um, and didn't know exactly how to operationalize this, but I knew that, the, you just knew that the role of the bystander was going to be significant here. So um, I kept drawing attention to what the bystanders are doing um, and that being an issue and, and uh, no one had a problem with that. Everybody just, everybody felt like, like that's true. Um, but I didn't have a framework, before the paradigm shift, I didn't have a framework to talk about that. I just knew that this was a piece of the puzzle. And so a lot of researchers were saying this kind of same thing. They weren't coming up with direct um, recommendations for interventions with, with anything, especially with bystanders, but they were, they were, we were starting to figure out what this was. We knew there was a role here. We wanted to understand it better so we could um, intervene in an, in an appropriate way. So this is where we're at. We're still, um, you know, probably in the 90s. Um, and, uh, or maybe now we're a little bit later. I want to review, um, I talked about it a lot, but now I'm going to talk really specifically about what this research did and didn't do. Um, uh, the good stuff I already talked about in terms of, we learned a little bit about development, we learned a little bit about victim types, we learned a lot about the incidence of bullying. So we did, we did a good job of raising awareness. Um, and we came up with important components for what would be any bullying prevention program. So the, the, the some of the components that we came up with 15 years ago, 20 years ago, are still being used today. This wasn't, this wasn't all for, we're using them differently now, but um, it wasn't, it wasn't for nothing. So, so I'm, I'm talking about how misguided the research was because I was part of that and I feel like an idiot. So I'm talking about it like that, but it wasn't, it, they, they did produce some good stuff. It also produced some bad stuff and I'm going to, I'm going to give you my own, an, an, uh, my own personal example. I told you I haven't done a ton of research since I left grad school, but I did do one research project at a therapeutic day school that I was working at about 10 years ago, um, maybe 11 years ago. And I was the um, chair of the bullying committee at this therapeutic day school in Highland Park. And I had a lot to say about bullying. I was considered the, the person that should lead this process and I loved it because I knew exactly what to do. I knew exactly what, how to build a program that educated staff, that, that, uh, that taught us the warning signs, that, that, that was able to deliver services to, to uh, bullies and victims that were supposed to correct the problem. I had some things about ongoing training, a lot about supervision, a lot about discipline. How do we swiftly discipline kids who were bullied? Creative ways to do that. I loved what I was doing. Um, and the research that I did was um, I took the continuum of bullying behaviors from the most aggressive to the most subtle, and I identified 13 separate behaviors. And what I did in a two year, in a two year span, what I did is I took some data on the incidence of these types of bullying before and after the program, and I knew that it was going to, um, I felt like it was going to, the school's pretty small, I had a lot of control over the training and the supervision, I felt like good results were going to happen, and they did. Um, the results of my research study, which I was able to present at an ISPA conference in 2005, I think it was, I was so proud of myself, was 11 of the 13 uh, behaviors on the continuum were reduced statistically significantly over the course of those two years during the program. So I got to, you know, the poster got accepted, everybody loved hearing about it, people are taking notes about what to put do at their schools and I was feeling pretty good about myself. Um, does anybody want to guess? Well, let me, uh, let me tell you this first. Um, the, uh, even though we were able to produce this research even back then, I didn't want to look at it too hard back then because I didn't know what to make of it, but even back then I recognized that in the two years that I'd done that, um, it didn't feel very different if, if you walked in the school. It didn't feel very different. It didn't feel like a safer place. And kids weren't saying, oh, this feels so safe here. I, don't, I never worry about coming to school. Everyone's so nice. Like the kids weren't, the kids weren't saying anything different. It didn't feel different. But I was able to produce all these results. If you, if you, you can do a Google search on, on bullying prevention programs, and there's a ton, and they're all going to say what I said. I got all these great results. You read on, or, or you listen on in terms of my case, and I'll tell you what happened with mine. 
you read on and they'll talk about, well, these, the results didn't last very long. We think it's because we didn't do enough ongoing training. Or there's some other, you know, ex explanation in, in some obscure part of the, conc the conclusion section that why, they're, why it, things weren't upheld or some things that they're going to do for the next study, you know, troubleshooting. Um, none of these, no one to this day can say, we found the recipe to put into a school so that, and then bullying doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, I feel like I have a blueprint now. Um, it's not a recipe, it's a roadmap, um, and it's hard, uh, but you're going to get that today. Um, uh <coughs> but does anyone want to guess the two behaviors on the continuum that were not decreased, in fact, were slightly increased? If you think of the bullying behaviors from, do you think they were, they were um, the more aggressive ones or the more subtle ones that, that we didn't touch, that we didn't reduce? I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. It was. It was the gossiping and social exclusion. Um, and the, yes, they're subtle, but um, does any guesses why those were the two, do you think, besides being subtle, that weren't impacted by my awesome program? Anything unique about those two versus some others? Well, thank you, because that's a huge part of it. These are, these are less detectable by adults. Um, even before social media, these were less detectable by adults. Now that social media is there, this is true, exp this is exponentially true. So if I, when I looked at the data objectively years later, after the paradigm shift, what I realized is I didn't do anything, hardly anything positive in those two years, except I made the bullies smarter. They stopped performing the less subtle forms of bullying because I was good at making sure adults would catch them in the act. That didn't change their attitude <laughs> towards hurting people. They just got smarter about how and when they were going to bully. That's why there was an increase in some of the less detectable ones. So I just changed their MO. I didn't, I, di I didn't change their MO. I just had to change their approach a little bit. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything of value. I mean, at the time, I, I didn't know what to make of this stuff. This, is, this wasn't until years later that I looked back and said, this is what happened. Um, and, you know, the, when I talk about the specific specificity of the results and the low significance of results, even though all these people like me can claim, hey, I, this program was associated with all these good results, it wasn't giving us anything that you could take in, and port somewhere else, transport somewhere else, and make, and make an impact. Um, and you were seeing that across the board. We were, we were making, I was making a lot of changes, but none of those changes were clinically significant. They weren't meaningful. It wasn't changing. The same kids were still saying, I don't want to go to school, which is all we, w that's the only outcome measure <laughs> we're looking at, right? Until every kid has no problem going to school based on how they're going to be treated, then and only then, that's the most important outcome measure. And we, I don't think we touched that one. We, the ugly part of this research is, um, <sighs> I'm just going to incriminate myself again, um, is the thing to do with, um, do you remember what we were telling kids? We some people still tell kids this now, and it drives me absolutely crazy, including the Disney Channel. Actually, the Disney Channel and Nick, they don't do this anymore. They, I said they're behind the times, but they're getting there. But 10 years ago, what was everybody telling kids who were bullied? What were they telling them? Fight back. Fight back. Fight back. What else were they saying? Tell, tell an adult. Stand up for yourself. Fight back. Tell an adult. Okay. Wow. We were misguided. Let's just let, let me play that out for you because I, I lived this. Um, so the good news about um, the good, uh, this, sorry, this is, I shouldn't be flipping about this, but the good news about treating victims of bullying is they are a really captive audience to a child psychologist. I spent a lot of time fighting with kids about them needing to be more aware about how their life needs to change a little bit, how they need to start thinking about doing things differently. You get, a, you get a bully victim in your office, and they want things to change yesterday. They, they'll do anything to not be bullied, right? So you have a very, um, you have a very engaged audience 
very motivated audience. And this was not lost on me. I loved it. And I, I thought these kids were so lucky to have me as a therapist because I, I was going to, I was going to make everything okay. Um, because I was saying what everyone else was saying, you just got to tell someone. Um, and I was saying you got to stick up for yourself. Um, uh, I wasn't saying um, that they should physically fight back. I'd actually be more. I'd actually be more prone to saying that now. Was what I know. Sorry, that that's I'll explain all that. Um, but but I was saying what everyone else was saying. Tell someone and. Stand up for yourself, okay? Here's what this, here's what this meant, though. Okay, I'm here, to, I'm here in 2015 telling you that I was a bull, I've been a bullying expert since 1995, and for the first 10 years that I was practicing, I didn't freaking know what I was doing. I thought I did. I didn't know what I was doing. So to think that we could tell a kid, just tell a, an adult, and they would know what to do with it was, was highly, <laughs> was overly ambitious, was very optimistic. Because if the so-called experts weren't make weren't making any changes then then um you know their favorite teacher you know might have some of the same problems doing it so we were telling kids to put it in the hands of adults and what adults were doing with that information adults were doing their due diligence and they were following their heart and they were saying i'll make it stop i'm gonna i'm on it this isn't gonna happen anymore so what they would do, what they were people like me were sort of training them to do a long time ago, is it should be documented. You know, the bully should be go through a disciplinary machine. Um, maybe their parents are contacted, depending on what kind of age they are. We might need to do some kind of problem solving remediation. Like, um, so this was sort of kind of what was happening. Um, we would tell we would tell kids that all you need to do is tell an adult. Adults would f it up, and now the kid's more of a victim because when we when we took the bully and put him into the disciplinary machine, the dumbest of bullying, the dumbest of bullies knows where the information came from. And so the very kid we were prying, trying to protect, we now have a bigger, brighter target on their face. And we've all seen this play out. And as much as people like us would want to try to stop it, and if you retaliate, you're going to even get in more trouble. Again, bullies are smarter than we give them credit. They're not. You know, they're going to do it in subtle ways, but they don't, you know. So these kids, by letting a staff know, not only were we not solving the problem, in a lot of cases we were making it worse. When we were telling them to stand up for themselves, this is my favorite because I laugh at myself with this, is I was one of the guys, and I wasn't the only one, that was telling kids, okay, um, here's what you do when you get bullied. These poor kids were taking notes. I was, I was writing them one-liners. I'm getting uh, emotional, but um, I was writing them one-liners of like, here's how, here's how you come back to someone who says something that's a bullying comment, okay? So I was basically saying, pretend that what's happening isn't hurting you and, and say this, and then they'll know that you're fighting back and you're, they're not bothering you, and they'll go away. Part of that was true. I mean, if bullies, it is bullying 101, that if bullies don't get the reaction that they want, they're smart enough to move on to something else. Um, but to watch these poor kids try to implement my treatment plan, I mean, I, I've been in the schools. I had to watch this happen. I had to watch these anxious, timid kids try to deliver an assertive one-liner to a bully in the middle of the interaction. And to say that they couldn't pull that off is a huge, huge understatement. It was awkward. It went over like a, I mean, they looked ridiculous. They were stuttering. They were tearful. I mean, and the bullies just thought this was the most hilarious thing in the world. I was making stuff for them, OK? What I should have been doing, instead of trying to get them to mask their hurts from the bullying is I should have tried to address the hurt and tried them, tried not to get them to be, to hide their hurt better, but not to feel as hurt. I'm going to talk about that, of course. But um, so there are some, we did, we did students disservices in, in, um, in coming to this, in over, over this journey 
okay? In trying to do the right thing, we were doing the wrong thing. There's a lot of parents in here, parents doing the same thing. If you were lucky enough to have your kid say that they were, that, that they were bullied, what do you do? You're on the horn and you're talking to the mom. <laughs> and <laughs> that, does, that never goes well. Maybe you get lucky, but um, that rarely, rarely goes well. But the parents were doing the same thing that, that school personnel was. I'll handle it. It's over. They try to address it the way they think they need to. They're just creating a bigger problem. Um, uh, okay, so I think I've done enough talking about um, setting the, the tone of how we got to all the work that was put in, and now we're, for me, we're probably 2002, 2003, um, maybe 2004, 2005, for me, um, where I'm scratching my head because um, the therapeutic day school that I used to work at, um, the way it was set up was each classroom had their own therapist. So um, I had a classroom of about 12 kids. It was essentially my own, my own like lab. <laughs> I think about it like that. But at a therapeutic day school, I had my own staff, my own caseload, my own head teacher as a, as a co-leader. And so to say that I had control over a small environment, again, was an, uh, that was, that's an understatement as well. So this was the best opportunity for me to come in to a, an environment that's even smaller than the whole school, just in my classroom, and to try to make something happen positively. Let me briefly talk about my success in there in the early part of the millennium, okay? I implemented everything that I've been teaching, and I trained my staff extremely, extremely well. And um, we, we couldn't make a dent in the problem at all. Um, we had relationships with these kids. The kids respected us, believe it or not, but we could not address the bullying problem um, from a larger scale. We just, we just didn't do it the way we wanted to. We were, we, we had protocols for what we would do disciplinary-wise if there was a bully. We had good ways to support victims after something happened. None of this changed the patterns of kids getting hurt in the classroom. We also got really, we got so good at the bully-victim dynamic that we were able to predict it before it, before it even happened. Um, there's one incident that comes to mind, but it, this probably happened dozens of times, is I'd be sitting in the classroom and someone over here, someone who is maybe lower on the social ladder, I'll, I'll refer to this metaphorical social ladder because as much as we hate them, we know what they are. She's lower on the social ladder and she said something in response to a teacher's question that it didn't sound very smart, okay? It was the wrong answer. She didn't really understand the question. And I knew that my good bully over here probably had something to say about that. So b b before I would hear her say that, and before he even opened his mouth, I would get eye contact with him, and I would say, don't even think about it. And I thought I was just dandy for, for that preempt strike. And he would just go, don't do what? Tell her that that was the most retarded thing that anyone could possibly say. Don't say that. Is that what you mean? His buddies would laugh. She's mortified. He would get up, he would get up to walk out the door because he knew exactly what the protocol was. Of course, he didn't care. He walked out with a smile on his face. So enough things like that. And I'm just going, what the frick? Where, what is the missing piece? Okay. Um, and this part always makes me emotional. I have no idea why you're going to hear the story. It's funny. It's not sad or anything, but I choke up every time. I don't I have no idea why. I can't fake this. This is just really weird. Um, I won't ask you where I, where I found the paradigm shift or who enlightened me, because you'll never guess. It was a 16-year-old drug dealer from Deerfield. Yeah. Why is this? Why is this emotional? I have no idea. Because <coughs> 16-year-old drug dealers should be the last place you look, right? We're talking about moral compasses and stuff. He didn't know, he didn't know what he was doing, but, but he enlightened me. And from this 
I talk about it like it was one moment, one conversation. I think it was a series of some, but I'm going to tell you about this conversation that really did happen that, w that best illustrates what opened my eyes to the paradigm shift. So, so uh, this kid, um, who, as I already mentioned, was a drug dealer, he came to our therapeutic day school because he got in trouble at his high school for stealing. Um, he was stealing scales from the chemistry lab. And it was really funny because the <laughs> minister is like, why would he want scales? <laughs> you know, sometimes ministers are really smart and sometimes they're not. Um, so we all kind of thought that was funny. Um, so he's there because he got busted for stealing. And now he's at a therapeutic day school to get behavioral support. And, you know, there was a manifestation. And we had, you know, I did it. I did an evaluation, whatever. Um, and... Uh, He'd been, he'd been with me for several months, and he was a kid that I got along with extremely well. Um, we both like sports. He was a, he's a, um, a real bright guy, funny guy, um, sarcastic like me. We hit it off, okay? Um, and I had him in my office one time, and um, he also, he was sophisticated. He, knew, he knows the rules about confidentiality. So he, he could be bold about telling me that he's still, you know, that he's still selling and, and, but he wouldn't give me so much information that it would pose the kind of risk that I would be able to like let anyone know about. He, he just knew, but I, I didn't mind that because I'm like, this kid, I, I have a relationship with this kid. If I can get this kid to stop, if, if anyone can get this kid to stop his drug dealing behavior, it's gonna be me. Cause I spend 30 hours a week with this kid. We're really tight. And I know him well enough to know that this is just not who he is and who he wants to be. Now, know that he's already heard a million times that um, he was a big-time hockey player, um, a D1 caliber uh, hockey player. Um, so he'd heard all the, you're going to get caught, and you're not going to be able to play hockey, you're not going to be able to go to college, you're going to, you know, and he heard all that, and you shouldn't do that, and, um, and he just, none of that phased him at all. So I tried to, I tried to be awesome with him, and, and which I wasn't, of course, and just, and just kind of said, you know, the thing that bothers me and should bother you is, Dude, I know you. You're a good kid. You have a good heart. Here's the problem with what you're doing in this community is it could easily happen on more than one occasion that you're going to be doing your thing, you know, selling little dime bags of marijuana uh, to kids who want to escape their problems. And, and this could happen on several occasions that you find a kid who, who experiments from you the first time and then and maybe he really likes it. Maybe he starts using more. Maybe he doesn't have it any other coping skills to use anymore because he's always relying on that and maybe he maybe he evolves into higher drugs and maybe maybe you ruin his life maybe his life goes down a path and he never comes back and it starts with you selling him I'm like you don't want that on your conscience like you're too good of a kid you know so I thought I thought I was laying it on pretty thick because again um, we have a good relationship he respects me and so I give him this little spiel and he just goes yeah, whatever, Dominguez, which I knew, because I knew him well, was his way of saying, I respect what you're trying to do, <laughs> but, I'm not <laughs> but I'm not changing my behavior. I, you know, I heard you, whatever, but no. Um, and I knew that. I, you know, I, wanted, I wanted to have an impact on him. I, was, I wish that I was planting a seed, but, but I, even as cocky as I was about this stuff back then, I, was, I didn't have any inclination that he was going to say, you know what, Dominguez, I never thought about that. Let me give you the stash that I have because I, I don't want any part of it anymore. I'm done. I'm done. Cold turkey. I, I, knew, I knew that wasn't going to happen. And, um, and no one in this room is surprised that he didn't stop his behavior either. Um, why? What are some reasons why you think that even my impassioned speech didn't, ha didn't alter his behavior at all? for sure, is certainly the fact that he's doing it against the counsel of adults gives him a sense of, I'm a rebel, I'm independent. So you're absolutely right. That's, that, that's, that's reinforcing more than, it is, um, more than it is correcting. What else? What are some more obvious ones?
I, I love what you said because everything is absolutely true, but you've probably never been to Deerfield. No, I have. Deerfield is a very affluent um, community. So that is absolutely something that promotes this kind of behavior. In his case, that did not apply, but it totally, totally does. This kid, this kid came from a, this, this, this was a, this was a seven figure home. Um, Yeah, you guys are awesome. This, this happens to other kids. But with this particular kid, it was even simpler than that. Everything you guys are saying is true. I love, I love where your heads are at. Um, in the North Shore, and if you don't live in the North Shore, be glad that you don't live in the North Shore. It's the, it's the affluent part of you know, the Chicago suburbs and very entitled families, very you know this and that. And um, in the North Shore, if you're a 16-year-old drug dealer, you have a lot of status because kids think you're so cool. You have, mo you have money. He didn't need it, but, but having his own money, being able to do that that way, the money and the status alone, in addition to, to what you mentioned about liking to be on the other side of the law, um, uh, was, were some of the, were the main reasons why um, he had no, no, plan, no plan at all to change his behavior. Um, kids revered him. Um, they knew what he did. They thought he was just the coolest guy. Um, everybody wanted to be his friend. Um, and he just, he just had a ton of status. And the fact that he dealt drugs, all that did was elevate and, and solidify his status. And he was smart enough to know. He didn't use words like that, but he was smart enough to know that. So no s impassioned speech from Dr. Dominguez was going was to change his mind. Okay. So a few weeks later, I don't remember the exact timeline. I had the exact same kid in my office because there was an incident in the classroom similar to the one where even though I had predicted the bullying behavior had happened anyway, it was similar to that. It was a different kid, same classroom though, same, same, same group of kids, um, where this guy, my drug dealer guy, laid into the poor girl who made the retarded comment or whatever. And he did it in a way that was even more cruel and brutal than usual. The context, I don't remember exactly, but it was it was a couple comments on top of each other about stupid, ugly, that's why no one ever likes you. I mean, it was, it was just it's awful, you know? And if you knew this kid, you're like, this, this doesn't fit. He doesn't think like, he just didn't think like that. There's something about, something else was going on that was turning him into this. It was kind of the feeling that I got, I just didn't know. Um, but, so now I got him in my office and I just want to wring the guy's neck because he knows full well how much damage he's going to do to this poor girl. And uh, we've talked about all this stuff. We talked about it in groups. We talked about it in individual. We talked about it all the time. And he just had so, so little, if any, consideration for this poor girl that I just, I was just tearing into him as best that I could, as impassioned as I would about, about the drug dealing, talking about how disappointed I was and where is his character and what kind of person would do that and if, what if your daughter was treated like, like, I, I was just throwing, I don't even remember what I said, but it, I threw the entire list of things at him. And he was respectful enough to be quiet and listen. And when I was done, guess what he says to me? Yeah, Dominguez, whatever. Same tone, same smirk, same look on his face, same everything, okay? This, this is what started the paradigm shift, okay? What this 16-year-old drug dealer told me um, he didn't tell me directly, but um, what I learned he was telling me is, Dominguez, you're barking up the wrong tree, okay? You're focused on the wrong problem. Let's go back to the drug dealing thing for a second, okay? Let's say that my impassioned speech got this kid to stop the drug dealing. How long do you think it would take another 16-year-old in that community to pick up where he left off? I'd give it about a week, okay? So if I, were to, if I were to successfully manage his, successfully cease his drug dealing behavior, which would be hard enough in itself, where would that get me? In terms of, where would that get us in terms of the society that we live in? Absolutely nowhere. Where would, where would, where would I get as a school? Absolutely nowhere, okay? 
So what he, again, he wasn't this smart to be able to talk about this. What he was saying is, I'm not the problem. Speaking about the drug dealers, I'm not the problem, okay? If people wanted to pay me to sell vacuums, I'd sell vacuums, okay? There's no market for vacuums. It's not my fault that kids want drugs. I'm just providing a service. You should be focused on why 13-year-old kids want to buy drugs instead of handle their business in a healthier way. You should be figuring out that problem, okay? Of course I should have been. That's just too big of a problem, though. That's really scary. But how, how right is that? Okay, if we're going to, you know, if we know that we're not going to get rid of drug dealing in this country or in any community, unless the community comes together and says, we don't want the product, we don't need the product, okay, then and only then will the, will the dealers disappear. They're smart. They're not going to hang a sign in front of a, door, a storefront that doesn't have any people coming in, okay? They'll switch to selling something else, okay, which is a huge part of the solution, by the way. Um, so now take that to back to the bullying example. Obviously, what I'm saying to you guys right now, and I'll say it explicitly, the, the drug dealing and the bullying are the exact same issue. It's a, it's a perfect comparison, okay? Because what he was telling me, we know what he was telling me about the drug dealing. Dominguez, you're looking at the wrong problem. He said the same, again, he didn't say it. I figured it out. Um, I was looking at the wrong problem. Because if I got him to stop bullying her or got him to say sorry and repair the relationship, how, how far did we really, really get? Maybe the girl feels a little bit better that next day, um, but I haven't changed anything. Okay, he's telling me with regard to drug dealing that unless you change the drug using culture, this problem's not going away. I'm the least of your worries. Guys like me are a dime a dozen. Your issue is you need to address the culture that values drugs enough to buy them illegally. Handle that problem and then maybe you can call yourself smart. Same thing with bullying, okay? If I get him or anyone else, any single person to stop um, on any one occasion, I really haven't done anything. I told you what I did in my own research where I was doing a lot of good things on paper, but what I wasn't doing is addressing the culture. I thought I kind of was by making the adults better at getting bullies in trouble and reacting faster and trying to help the victims sooner, but that's not the part of the culture that needed to change. Um, the, the, the culture was already saying, we don't approve of drug dealing, we don't approve of bullying, that's not the part of the culture that needed to change that already existed and kids weren't responding to it. We needed to change the culture in a way more significant way. So we need to do the equivalent, is what I learned from him, we need to do the equivalent of addressing the drug using culture when, when we're talking about bullying. And I'm going to put this into, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, put some, gra not graphics here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys what I mean. We're, we're starting to roll into it now. This is the paradigm shift. Bullying is not the problem. Um, it's a symptom of a much larger problem. The problem is the culture in which bullying exists. Whether it's a classroom culture, a school culture, a community culture, a team culture, a, uh, I don't know, um, club culture. Um, when you look at bullying, as not a problem in and of itself, but as, a, but as a popular symptom of an unhealthy culture problem, all this stuff now makes sense. All my failures now make sense because I was barking up the wrong tree. I was chasing rainbows. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't addressing the very thing that could shift um, that can shift this type of behavior in a meaningful way, and that only happens if you impact the culture. If I were to retitle this presentation to what it should be, it should be about building a healthy culture. It's not about bullying anymore, because that, that teacher who raised her hand and said, based on that definition, all my kids are bullies, so now what do I do? Um, I, wish, I wish I was talking to her um, three years ago instead of six years ago, because I would have told her, it's not about bullying. 
Don't worry about, don't even worry about the label. But what I'm saying is the subtle things that well, this kid's doing and the not so subtle things that those kids are doing, those are both symptoms of a larger problem which says your culture is not healthy enough um, to prevent unhealthy behaviors. So everything we do from now on in this talk is going to be uh, talking about how we create um, a healthy culture, okay? Um, the I don't know um, the best way to, um, well, I'm going to try. Um, imagine, um, imagine that I was taking a road trip, and on a Sunday morning in Alabama, I stepped into a, to a Southern Baptist church, okay? And I'm the only non-black person there. They're singing. There's a strong community there. And when the song's over and everybody sits down and the, and the, the, the minister's about to speak, I yell out an off-color joke, like a racist joke against blacks. Not that I would ever do that, but I'm just, I'm just saying. I use the, I use the ex example of a church on Sunday morning just to lessen the likelihood that I would actually get my butt beat. But that's probably what would happen. But let's pretend nobody got violent that day. Um, but what would, what would people's response be um, to me on that day after I made that comment? The reason why I'm asking this particular question in this hypothetical scenario is um, here's an example of a group of people at this church that share, definitely share a strong, strong value against racist jokes, okay? So what happens when everyone in a community has strong values against certain behavior, here's what it looks like, okay? If I did that, what would happen, again, if I didn't get my butt kicked, is people would look at me with a look of, disgust and embarrassment. Oh, how could you say something like that? What kind of person would say that? And at the very least, I would be asked to leave immediately, if not escorted out by my face or whatever, okay? I'm throwing this out. It's a hypothetical scenario, but when you have a community culture who shares a strong value against a certain type of behavior, that's what happens in response to it, okay? And needless to say, even if I was psychotic, I would not go back into that Southern Baptist Church or any other one and try to do the same thing again, okay? Unless, of course, I was, you know, trying to do a social experiment or something to prove my point. So my point is there was nothing reinforcing at all about me making that comment in that context. I mention that because we need to create a culture in our schools and in our homes where everybody shares that strong value about, that's not just bullying, about being unkind, about being dismissive, about being exclusive, about um, hurting people to promote yourself. You know, all the all the things that kids do to hurt each other, that hurt each other. We need to build a culture that where everybody in that culture has a strong value against such things, and they can respond in ways that are not reinforcing. Similar to responding in ways with the drug dealing thing where nobody's knocking on that guy's door anymore to ask for any weed because they don't want it, they don't need it. Okay, that's how the problem goes away. If no one's buying drugs, he's not a drug dealer anymore or he's a really broke one, okay? So that's, that's how the problem goes away. So how, how do we do that? Um, so now, um, if we look at the bully now, in this, in this paradigm shift, it's different. It's a lot different. Remember that I was saying bullies are people too. We need to give them, we need to understand their story and how they're getting abused in their homes maybe. Um, they need anger management, they need empathy building, they need social problem solving skills. All that may be true, um, but that was, my only, that was my only focus. And then I was the guy who gave these guys all these skills training. Spent a whole lot of time doing it and did it pretty darn good. And <laughs> it didn't have an impact, okay? So in this, in this new 
within this paradigm, within this new paradigm, we look at bullies very, very differently. Okay, number one, they're a dime a dozen. Okay, so number two, they're kind of smart. I mentioned that before. Number two, they're smart because they don't look smart, and we don't like to think of them as smart, but they're smart because here's what they've done: they've they've recognized what this game is. They've recognized that the game, that they, they've recognized that there's a social ladder and they recognize how the game works in order to be on top and stay on top, okay? I don't want to slap these guys five or give them too much love on this, but they figured it out. They figured out what the game is. They figured out how to stay on top of it. And that way, they're very smart. You know, they might be equipped with, with some skills that make it easier for them to climb the social ladder. They might be good looking. They might be strong. They might be charismatic, which means they might, they might be able to get a lot of people to back them. Um, so, you know, they might have all that. But for the most part, I'm indifferent to the bullies now because any farm animal can be mean to somebody. I'm not impressed with these guys. They're not, they're not how this problem is going to go away. They're just filling a gap in an unhealthy social culture that shouldn't be there anyway. Okay, because there isn't if there isn't any room at the Southern Baptist Church for, for someone to tell racist jokes, then there doesn't need to be room for a kid who to bully in, a, in any school environment. It's the same idea. It's hard to get there, but that's where we're going, and we're not going to stop until we get there, um, or we can't complain about the problem anymore because this is the direction that it's heading. Um, so, one, I'm indifferent in that. You know, I'll just let them know. Um, and this is how I talk to my bullies now. Um, congratulations for, um, for, for being in this position where, where you get to be mean to people and no one gives you a hard time about it except for adults that you don't listen to anyway. But I'm warning you, um, step down the ladder while you can or we're going to knock you off and it's going to be funny. Um, the dialogue I'm saying is um, we're going to change the game. Okay, you, you know the game and you're playing it. We're going to change the game completely. We're going to tear it down. What we were doing before, in keeping with this metaphor, is we just kept adding rules to the game, thinking, trying to get two steps ahead of the bully. We just kept adding on stuff. And that, that just wasn't working because, again, we were addressing the wrong problem. Um, uh, accountability and restorative justice. These are Restorative justice is something that's got... Um, I like that it's gotten a lot of attention in the last four or five years because um, I've been talking about this forever. I didn't call it that, um, but I've been talking about this forever. In this new paradigm, the only, the only use for a bully, um, it, in, in, or, in addition to helping other bullies um, pro-socially, um, is in how they can repair the culture that they have infected, okay? Again, the metaphor is bullying can only happen in an unhealthy classroom culture, school culture, team culture, club culture, family culture, okay? So everything we do now is trying to get this culture to be healthier, where the, where the, where the bullies play a role in creating and maintaining a healthy culture is when they've done damage to somebody's feelings that they need to do the relationship repair. This is a form of restorative justice. You take from a community, you need to give back. And more importantly than that, you need to understand why you need to give back. It goes without saying that as this healthy culture is developing, the motivation that a bully might have to repair the damage that they've done is probably pretty low. Okay, this is this is one of the areas why this is such hard work. How do you get a bully to repair damage to a culture when he's benefiting from the culture being damaged? He wants the culture to stay unhealthy because he's found himself as the king of that hill. He doesn't want the hill to change. He doesn't want the hill to become an even playing field. He wants, he likes his spot at the top. So this is where, um, and I'll talk about this more, but this is, so that's what the accountability piece and that's what the giving back to the community 
to, to the community and to the people in it. That's where this fits in to building a healthy culture. Now, um, since most kids, especially as we're developing, since most bullies aren't, aren't going to be that motivated, um, this is where I've used this is where I've, I've used coercion and punitive measures. Not really bad, but like, I don't care if you want to do it or not, you're doing it. You know, you're, just going, you're just going through the motions. So I'm, I'm going to tell you what you need to do, and I don't care if you don't see the value in it, because at that point, at this point, they don't. They might even feel threatened by what I'm trying to do, because they might be smart enough to know that if the culture gets healthy, they got to find another gig. And they're not going to have, they, they're not, it's not going to be as clear to them to figure out how they stay on top. Um, so that's where, that's where a lot of the hard work comes. So if you have a bully in your office, okay, I want you to, th uh, you can think about it in the frame of whatever disciplinary measures and plans you have already, but I want you guys to put in accountability and restorative justice, relationship repair. I want you to put that at the forefront of everything. How has he taken away from this community and how can he give back? And yes, as adults, as parents, and as school personnel, we do have the leverage to say, you're not returning to this program <laughs> until you've done this. And yes, sometimes kids are going to go through the motions and not know why we're doing it. But at that point, we, they're, they're still going to be expected to do it anyway. And we're going to do our best to let them know why that was important. We're going to walk them through the process. If they, if they BS their way through the process, we're going to say, good job BSing your way through the process. Pretty soon, you're going to have to look in the mirror and realize that you have, you're a person of weak character. I, I wish that you would have we're sincere about what you just went through. You went through it, so we're letting you back to the program, but I'm disappointed that you didn't, that you weren't more sincere, sincere about what happened. Because um, I'm worried that you're going to make the same mistake and treat other people like crap, and we're going to be back here talking about this again, which would be fine with me, but um, I wish you were thinking about this differently. So you will have kids that will BS their way through the process, but when you're dealing with bullies at your, in your house or in your school, have them repair the damage that they've done, either to the relationship or to the community. And I don't have to tell you what that could look like, because you know what they take away. They got to be able to give it back, and you structure it that they're not that that there's no way out. There's there's you're, they're not going to be able to not do that. Um, uh, I am not a hypocrite. I have a nine and eleven year old. Um, I have nine eleven year old kids. I have an older daughter and a younger son. Luckily, they get along pretty well. But when they're mean to each other. They, they know the process that they have to go through. They hate it. They think, they think daddy's being ridiculous, but they have, they have to address the wrong that they've done. Not in a big Oprah Winfrey show way, but just like they just have to address what they did. Um, and, um, and I can talk about what a relationship pair model looks like. And I will tell you guys what a relationship model looks like right now. It's not in this slide, but if you want to take notes on it, you can. It's a four-step process that that I developed with my staff and my students three, four years ago. And we talked about when somebody, when someone has done something to hurt you, what would you need from them in order to feel better about that situation, like that relationship has started to be repaired? And here's what we came up with, and this is not rocket science, but I want to give you a structure, because if you have young kids, if you have young kids at home or high school students in a, in a in a, at a high school, you can use this. You should use this, <coughs> if I could be so bold and recommend it. The first step of relationship repair, no surprise, is, is a sincere apology. Um, yes, that's a no-brainer. It's the sincere part that, um, you know, is obviously the operative word. Um, if, they, if they can't um, be sincere about an apology, this step, this whole process doesn't make sense. Um, so, you know, again, we can we can help them go through the motions and talk them through it. Um, but in terms of if you if you need some relationship repair because somebody hurts you, if the first part of their repair process is apologizing to you insincerely, obviously the, the <laughs> there's not much repair that's going to be okay. The repair job's going to suck. Okay, so what a what a sincere apology looks like, and I don't. This is not as intuitive as. I mean, you guys are all smart, and this won't be a shocker, but I want it's worth stating. A sincere apology is not only acknowledging what you did, but it's recognizing how that behavior caused them harm. Whether you meant it or not, this was my fight that I had with my daughter. 
because she didn't mean to do it, so she didn't think she needed to apologize. That is not true, okay? Um, I did acknowledging what you did and acknowledging how this could have been hurtful um, to that person, from their perspective at least, even if you don't, even if you don't believe that, okay? Um, if, uh, if, if I cut you guys off, on, if, I, if, if I cut this gentleman off on Army Trail on the way here, you know, I was like, I didn't know where I was, and I just cut in front of him, you know, um, and then I realized that he's following me here, <laughs> and then now we're in the same room, and he was I knew he was cussing me out. Now I got to do some relationship repair, okay? What I, my, my step one sincere apology is, is, dude, I was the guy, you may know this, I was the guy in the Xterra who just cut in front of you because I saw um, Gary drive too late, and I just, I totally cut you off, and I realized that could have been really dangerous for you and probably made you pretty upset, okay? That's what a sincere apology sounds like. It's not just I'm, it's not just I'm guilty, it's I realize how that could have really been, that I realize how that hurt you in a negative way, okay? The second thing is an explanation. And an explanation needs to be distinguished, of course, from an excuse. You guys know the difference between explanation and excuse, but sometimes kids turn this stage into an excuse intuitively because they don't know how to accept blame very well. In this case, an excuse was, was I had missed the turn. I, I was afraid I was going to miss the turn, and before I even thought to see if there was anyone in that lane, I just automatically turned over because I didn't want to go past it and have to turn around. All that does, okay, you know, there's, could there, you know, the line between it, uh, an explanation and excuse, it can be blurry. But what an ex the purpose of an explanation is when you're doing repair, the other person has to know that you've at least given some thought to your behavior. You've at least started the process of, why did I do that? And it makes more sense in steps three and four. But so, again, this is not an excuse, but he deserves some sort of, you know, whether it's, I'm just a really bad driver, and I've been in a million accidents, and I'm so glad you w that we didn't get in an accident. I'm like the worst driver. I mean, that's another explanation. <laughs> um, he needs some kind of context, and he needs, he deserves a context, and he deserves me saying, I've thought this through, and I think I know why, how I made this mistake, because that leads into step three, which is, which is the commitment, you know, which is um, I need to make sure that for, <laughs> for your sake and everyone else's sake that shares a road with me, that whether I'm in a hurry or not, or whether I think I'm going to miss a turn or not, I need to double check. And if someone's there, I just need to go through the light and take my time and turn around, not just, not just cut over. I have to do that so, so I don't get in any accidents and actually cause harm to people. Okay? That's a commitment based on this incident that I just made up. And the fourth step, which is the easiest to say and hardest to do, is just, just uh, following through on the commitment. Because I could do all the first three steps great, and then if I do the same thing to him on the way out of here, I haven't repaired anything. Okay, if, if on the way out of here he happens to be behind me and here I am, I, you know, 355's coming up and I didn't know it was coming up so fast and I need to make a left turn and he's in the left lane and I, I put my blinker on and double check and he's there and I don't turn and we wave at each other and he slows down and waves me and he knows that I've changed my behavior and he probably feels better and like I, the, the repair's done. He was going to kill me two hours earlier but I just did a little relationship repair. I'm just giving you an example of that four-step process that you should teach all your children um, when they're real young about how to repair um, social damage. Um, and when you have a high school kid at Glenbard or wherever, and they're in your office and they've, they've, done, some, they've done some bullying, part of the restorative justice process is to get them to, to if relationship repair is part of the process, here's the structure that you can use. You know it's not rocket science, but it's a teachable structure. And when you do it right, um, it, um, it teaches kids how to go through this in a way that's less um, insincere, right? Sorry, 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 I won't do it again. You know, it's very different. My apology to him was very different. My relationship repair was very different than, dude, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so um, so that's, that's the focus that we w I went from trying to give the bully punishment and anger management skills to relative indifference, restorative justice, and congratulations for being able to play this game at a high level, but the game is going to change, so just get ready.
Just get ready to be knocked off the, the hill because the hill's coming down. Um, lots of implications for the victim. I talked about this before. Um, and this is as a parent and as a, there's some very practical strategies I'm going to give you again right now. Um, so we're done, and thankfully, as of recently, Disney and Nickelodeon are also done saying, tell your teacher, stand up for yourself. They're doing, they're doing things that are more consistent with, with my message now, um, and I'll say more about that. But we're not just saying, stand up for yourself and tell a teacher anymore. Um, or fight back. Um, uh, this is about, um, instead of me trying to help them mask how hurt they are so that the bully won't get the reinforcement that they want from hurting them, which makes sense, um, I just realized that that's too hard to ask a 12-year-old to pretend that they're not hurt when they are because bullies, bullies are very good at being personal. And they're very good at making kids believe that they're being bullied because of something that's wrong with them, not because the guy in front of them is an absolute asshole. It's really hard for a victim to not personalize this. But nobody said this work was easy. Your job is going to be to help depersonalize this for the victim. And I'm going to give you some discussion points. I'm going to give you some, some more specific strategies. The way I want kids to understand bully victimization, I'm going to give you guys another metaphor. And these metaphors are, they don't go over as well in while the kid is in the process of being really, really, really sad having just been bullied. So this is more like a preventative discussion when it goes well, um, whether it's a school or a family. Um, but um, How should, I, how should I say this? So, um, I'm trying to think. Should I? Yeah, okay. Um, <coughs> pretend that, um, pretend you're walking along the sidewalk uh, on a day after it rained the night before, and uh, there's a pothole next to the sidewalk, and a car unknowingly drives by, they hit the pothole, and now you're soaked, now you're soaked in mud, okay? That sucks, right? I mean, I don't know if it's ever happened, it's happened to me once, that really sucks, okay? Um, the first thing that happens is you think people did it on purpose, and there might be some 16-year-old drivers that look, they go out and look for potholes and people on the sidewalk, and that was something, that might be something that I would have done at that age, sadly, um, once or twice. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, you were just at the wrong place at the wrong time, okay? Uh, getting, getting crapped on by a seagull. I'm from California. This would happen all the time. Yeah, that sucks. That's gross, and it, feel <laughs> it, it feels personal <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, okay? This really is the same with bully victimization. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. They're going to have such a hard time believing this because it feels so personal. It's easier with the mud splatter and the, and the seagull stuff. Um, but it is the same thing, because the truth is, and they might have an easier time believing this, the truth is, if they weren't at school that day to be bullied, it's not like bullying behavior would not have occurred. Someone in that same situation would have been on the business end of whatever, whatever comment some jerkball wanted to say. So part of that's, that's one discussion point about the depersonalization process because depersonalization has to happen. The worst, the most impactful thing about being bullied is that it feels personal and the bully has succeeded in making you feel like the lowest form of life on the planet and it feels awful. So that's the first part and those are some discussion points about the, about the depersonalization. Um, and as adults, I think we can appreciate that that, I that, that is true. Um, if if that particular victim was somewhere else at that time, someone else would have been bullied in some way in that classroom in that, in that instance. That's how unhealthy culture, cu cultures work. It's not about them. It's more about the bully, and it's even more about the culture. So that's the first thing that I want a victim to hear. Um, and um, <coughs> then there's some three specific things that 
that I want you guys to do, whether it's your own children or kids at a school that come to you and say, I've been bullied and they're really upset. Um, this is when we would do the, um, I mean, I think we're always good at validating the emotion. I'm so, you know, I'm so sorry um, that that happened to you. That it's, I feel really, really, really sad for you. That must have, that must have been, that must have felt awful. Um, I call that the emotional validation part. Um, that's, that's not the part that I, that's not, that part comes very instinctively to most uh, parents and a lot, of, uh, a lot of people working with kids. So that's still the first step when you have a bully victim in front of you who's hurting, is you're gonna, st you're gonna get them to a more stable spot emotionally. You're gonna, s you're gonna soothe them, you're gonna talk them through a high level of emotional, emotional arousal to a, a more manageable one, okay? So don't expedite through this process, don't skip this step, but the first thing you have to do, and this goes, if, if anyone has ever been in an argument with anybody, we know that people need to be at emotionally sort of stable spot before constructive conversations can happen. I mean, we, 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 we have examples in our own lives all the time. So that's, that's the first step, is make sure you're, you're giving them the emotional support that they need and you're getting their, their emotional arousal level from really high to a more manageable one, okay? They're not, you're not gonna, they're not gonna be excited, but just want them to be more in control. They came to you and they were devastated and now they're just, now they're just a little hurt, but they're ready to, they know that you've listened, okay? You've validated their perspective, you're there with them. Um, they feel like, um, they feel like they can partner with you now. And now you're in a conversation that can be constructive, okay? This is different than anything you've ever heard before, I promise, in dealing with a bully victim and it's based on the, the, the new paradigm and the, uh, my new paradigm and what I've been speaking since then is when, when step one is sufficiently complete and you have the kid in a, in a more stable spot emotionally and they're engaged in this conversation, what I want you guys to do is I want you to ask them a specific question um, in whatever style you think you need to, okay? It's a question that we know the answer to and we want the kid to arrive to. If we have to spoon feed it to them, we will. But the question that I want you to ask is when this was going on, when you were being treated this way, or right after you, you went through this awful interaction with that guy who was such a bully, was there anything different that could have happened that didn't happen today that would have made you feel a little less bad? Would anything have made it less traumatic or awful? The first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna look at you like you're crazy because they're not expecting that question and they don't even know why you're asking it. Okay, so expect, expect a little bit of a weird response. I've done this a million times and the first time I have this conversation with a kid, I get it every time. Why the frick are you asking me that? <laughs> okay, but you ask that question and we know what the answers are. Instinctively, we know what the answers are and if the kid can, if we can get the kid there, great. If we need to get him there, we'll do it. The answers are, well, if somebody would have said something to the bully, like, leave him alone. Or why are you picking on that guy? Or why are you such a, why are you such a jerk? That would have felt a little bit better. Somebody stepping up and saying, why are you treating this kid like that? This kid's cool, okay? Um, if you think that little thing doesn't go a long way to a bully victim, you're wrong. Um, and once you've, once the, the, once the person, the kid that you're talking to has a good idea of that, um, that, that saying something to the bully would have felt better because you would have felt like, you wouldn't have felt so alone. You wouldn't have felt like ganged up on. You would have felt like people were supporting you. And because right now you don't feel supported at all. You feel this tall, but that would have made you feel at least that, that some people had your back and that would be, that would have been less bad, right? Yes. What else? Answer number two is if someone had supported the kid, if someone had went up to them during or after and said, I'm so sorry, I heard what that idiot said to you. He said that to me before and I remember being so upset. I just want you to know that's not about you. It's about him being a jerk. I just, I felt really bad that he said that I wanted to make sure you were okay. That took 10 seconds or whatever. You know this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen in school. Um, it doesn't happen with my daughter and her friends. She doesn't even know why I tell her she needs to. Um, we're teaching this from the, we're teaching this from the ground up. When it, once, once you got this kid 
to acknowledge, which is actually easy for them to acknowledge. Again, they might need help to get there, but had somebody said something to the bully or had somebody supported me, that would have made this a little less bad. And I will actually say a lot less bad, and I'm gonna tell you another little story. But um, the third step before I tell the story is, um, now we wanna make, now we're gonna shift, the third step is getting them to make a commitment, okay? The commitment is, since we know that there are two things that could have helped you at this time where you were being bullied, I want you to commit to me that anytime you ever see anyone get bullied, that you're gonna do one of those two things or both. Um, and I need you to promise me that you're gonna do that. Because um, if you did that and everybody did that, that's how this goes away, by the way. This is the, this is the small behaviors that have huge, huge impact. If everybody did what we're teaching right now, the bullying problem goes away because there's no impact. If the bullies don't get the enforcement that they're looking for, the status or the power or whatever, if that's not there, they're done. Just like if they're not getting paid for selling weed, they're not selling weed anymore. That's, just, that's why the comparison still holds. <coughs> the, other <thing, coughs> the other reason why I created this model of victim, bully victim support is we all have people in our lives who spend a lot of time talking to us about how bad their life is. Okay, we might love them, but they spend a lot of time convincing us how much of a victim they are. And as a good person, you want to hear that and support that, and it gets a point where in your head, you're just kind of saying, shut up. Sh just deal, <laughs> deal with it. Okay, I think we all have felt that before. There's, I'm going to tell you why we feel that way. It's because um, there's something very disempowering about assuming a victim role. Even if you're a legitimate victim, assuming that victim role is extremely disempowering. And I mean, you can refer to any kind of victim literature and this, this will hold up every time. We don't like to talk about the victims needing to do anything different because we're, we're feeling so sorry for them for being legitimate victims, but we all need to know that, con that, that settling into a victim role or, consider or having the perspective that you're a victim is, is not going to be constructive. It can't be constructive. Just like, just like the friend who keeps talking about how they're victimized, victim, victim, victim. They, they always see things through that lens and they never get out of it. And it drives you crazy the 30 millionth time that they're talking to you about the same stuff. So it's not, I know it seems insensitive because from one perspective, kid comes to you and says, oh, I've been bullied and I'm sad. And you're saying, well, you need to do this the next time that someone else bullies. That's essentially what I'm doing, but remember, remember step one. Okay, we're, we're hand-holding these kids through this process. We're giving them the emotional support, but we're leading them in the right direction. You are not, we don't want them to come away thinking that they are a victim. We want them coming away knowing that they were in the bad, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time on that day, and that they figured out how to make other people not feel as bad as they did that day, and we gave them something very specific, and now instead of being a victim who doesn't want to go to school the next day because they're, wor they're worried about running into that next guy, now they, have, now they have something positive to think about. They're empowered now. Okay, I don't know how many kids are going to really get into this, but at least we've given them something to think about other than something to be worried about. Now they can think about, if I see other kids being treated badly, I know I'm going to do one of those two things or both. Okay, that's the model that we're teaching. That's the model that we are continuing to promote and talking about. But that's what we do, that's what we should be doing with victims now, okay? Um, in, the, um, in the larger picture, of course, you know, some of the things we learned early on about services for victims, I mean, because it still really is about self-esteem, you know, and their, their own self-worth. So that clinical piece, it always need to, needs to be addressed um, on an ongoing basis because in it's an occupational hazard that if I, if I work with behaviorally disturbed kids and I have to set limits on them dozens of times in a week, um, they will say awful things to me. 
that could be considered bullying or definitely part symptomatic of an unhealthy culture or whatever. They can say a lot of mean things, and I'm not impacted by it, right? I mean, Dominguez, you're so ugly, I can't believe your wife even agreed to marry you. She's probably sleeping with the mailman. And I can look at them and laugh and say, you know, she might be. He's a good-looking guy. I should be worried about that. I should call her and make sure she's at work. She might be with him right now. Um, I can, you know, I know that that comment of that 13-year-old kid doesn't make, doesn't make my wife's affair any more true than, you know, just because he said it. This is not my issue. It's his, okay? My level of self-esteem is, is much different, but that is, that is an ongoing support that we're going to give these kids because it's my ability not to personalize that comment, even though it's very hurtful, right? It didn't impact me at all, but it was tremendously hurtful and tremendously personal. But I, my self-esteem was such, and I was able to depersonalize that and say, that's not about me, that's about him. And it was actually kind of funny. And, and he's handicapped a little bit because he didn't really get the, re the response that he wanted, so all of a sudden those comments aren't as fun for him to say, okay? So in order for a kid to buy into the depersonalization, we can give them the metaphors of the seagull and the, and the, muddy, and the mud puddle to talk about depersonalization, but if they're really going to feel that it wasn't personal, this ongoing work with self-esteem has to happen. So these services, as much as we can support that, um, and I think that's intuitive, you guys kind of know that, but that, that plays in here in a big way, and we've known that, we've known that for a long time. Um, I don't know that I need to do this, but I will tell you, people ask me, um, you know, Dimitri, you talk about bullying all the time. Were you bullied when you were a kid? And the answer is not really because, um, I mean, I was, but not, that's not why I went into this. I told you how I got into this, but, um, you know, my, my school was no different. My middle school was no different than anyone else's, the way the games were played. And if, it, and if, you, if you played sports and you had a cute girlfriend, you were, you were kind of off limits. You were high enough on the social ladder. We didn't have to worry about this stuff, okay? So that's where I was in high school, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, um, what that meant, and the people who work in a high school, this is this is um, going to be really going to be really relevant. But um, before I switch over there, um, I want to tell you a story about how powerful um, just these steps can be. Okay, um, when I was 15 years old, I was a pretty good basketball player for um, or for my age, even though I was kind of little. Okay, and in the summer, I didn't have the money that some of my, that the guys I played with to go to like summer camp. So what I would do, because I loved playing, is there was a park that was pretty close to my house, like a street ball park, where there was really, really, really good basketball going on, and I always wanted to play there, so I would go. The problem was the guys who played there were 19 and 20-year-old African-American guys who were tremendously, <laughs> a lot bigger than me and very athletic. But I was relatively, I was really good for my age. So I felt that I could play with them. The problem was when I go there, and I'm there, I'm by myself, I ride my bike there, and I'm kind of quiet, and I'm standing there, I'm waiting for my turn to play, and sure enough, that no one even acknowledges that I'm even there. Um, and it takes me an hour to even try to figure out how to get on the court. And the way I figured it out is, you know, it's one of those things, the games are pretty fast, and if you win, you stay on, and then the next person, you know, someone's supposed to be up next, and they pick three other people, and then it goes. But these guys kept picking, no one ever gonna pick me. So I had to figure out, how to do this, and I finally got enough confidence right after a game ended that I took the biggest guys, the three biggest guys on the team that just lost, I said, do you guys want to play again because I'm up? And they said, yeah, 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 we're up with, we're up with white boy. That literally, that's a direct quote. We're, and so they just wanted to play again, and they said something to me like, don't shoot. Something like, like give us the ball, something, like they didn't want me, in, but I knew that anyway, I wasn't gonna, so, um, so, First couple games, I'm, um, I, don't, I don't say a word. I'm just passing it to the biggest guy every time. I don't want to, I'm just glad to be out there, right? Got a little bit of, got, we kept winning. I got a little more confident. I started shooting. I was doing okay. I was scoring. The guy that was, the guy that was guarding me was getting laughed at because I was scoring on him. And he didn't like that. So what he was saying to me was, you don't even want to know. He was threatening me. He was punching me down the court. When I would shoot, he would, he would punch me in the stomach. All these guys saw they didn't They didn't do anything. Um, and this guy was literally threatening my life. If you, if you score off me again, you're dead. Literally. Not, he, was, he didn't have a gun or anything, but, but he, he, I was scared. Okay? 
and he wanted it that way. So at that point, I should have left because I was really scared, but I was so scared of walking away in what they were going to say or do. So I just felt like I was trapped, okay? We kept winning, though, and I just, I never opened my mouth, I never looked the guy who threatened me in the eye, I never tried to egg him on or do anything else like that. I was just trying to be, and um, the, one of the, one of the leaders, one of the, one of the main guys pulls me aside. He didn't have to do this, but I'm, I'm scared to death, okay? I'm too scared to leave. I'm too scared to stay. I'm outside myself. I just want everyone to decide to leave so I can just leave without any marks and be good. He comes up to me. He goes, don't worry about what, I think his name was Harold. Harold or Homer? I, don't worry about what Homer said. He's, he always talks like that. You can play here whenever. You're cool. You can play here whenever you want. Okay, that took him seven seconds. I went from totally, totally scared to totally, totally comfortable just by one person giving me that one supportive comment, okay? It changed my affect completely from these guys could all maul me at the end of the game because I'm not like them to it's not about me. He, that's just him and if, you know, and, 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 I'm not, and, I don't, and I'm not unsafe, okay? So you can have a million stories about how those little comments can be unbelievably um, impactful, in a positive way. Um, my thing about, the reason why I mentioned my status in high school um, is because I was in the unique position to have so much of a positive impact like the way that I'm trying to teach right now. I feel like a total hypocrite because I didn't do any of the things that I was preaching, I'm preaching to you guys right now about what we should be teaching kids. That's, if th that's probably the answer to the question about Dominguez, why do you get choked up and why do you, why do you do, why do you, why did you get so into this topic? This is probably why, is because I was always kind of a nerd in school. Like I always got good grades, but I always, um, I was always playing sports. So I had, I had a lot of friends from my sports teams. And I had a lot of friends from my, high, my upper level classes. And as you could imagine, they weren't the same groups of people. There were some, but, but for the most part, I had social connections with um, the smart kids, some of whom were, were bully victims because they were smart, and, um, and some athletes, a lot of whom were bullies, okay? Um, I'm proud to say that I wasn't a, a strong bully myself. I didn't get off on saying mean things to people. I also wasn't the kind of person that would laugh or get really excited if somebody said something mean, so at least I wasn't a total, total jerk, but, but I messed up big time because if I'm listening, if I'm if I'm listening to my own advice right now, there were so many times in high school and middle school where I would be in a hallway or in a lunchroom or whatever, and some someone that I was affiliated with or some friend of a friend would say something absolutely awful to someone walking by about fat, ugly, stupid, la la la, um, um, ho this like, and. Even though I didn't laugh or add on, um, what a jerk I was for not doing what I'm preaching right now. I just, I sat there and did nothing. And to be honest, I wasn't even that conflicted about it at the time because I was 13, what, 13, 14, 15. And, and I was saying to myself, kind of like my daughter, I, I didn't do anything wrong. Um, what do I have to, you know, it's not my problem. I wasn't, I wasn't part of it. Um, in the new paradigm shift, you're absolutely <laughs> You're the, you're the biggest part of it. This is where the bystander stuff comes in and comes in hard. You are, you're the most fertile ground in terms of the problem solution. How hard would it have been of me, for me, to, you know, the girl in my AP English class who's overweight and who walked by my friend of a friend and got called fat this, fat that, how hard would it have been of me to tell the guy, dude, shut up and leave her alone. She's in my English class and she's actually really funny. You don't need to talk to her like that. How hard would that have been? That's not social suicide to me. I'm already connected with that guy. Um, and even if it was, even if, even if it was, even if I wasn't connected to that guy, I can go to her, which I also didn't do when I saw her in class and said, I heard what he said to you, and he's such an a-hole for doing that. I'm so sorry you had to hear that. You know, you totally didn't deserve that. I don't want you to take that personally because he's one of those idiots who thinks that being mean is funny. He's wrong, okay? Would she? That's not going to make her day, but it's going to be very, very, it's going to feel very, very, very different, just like it was with me on the basketball court. So um, these, things are, these things are powerful, powerful things. So when we talk about 
the bystander is the main is the big piece of this now because it's the bystanders that um, that define the culture. Okay, I talked about us, me and other researchers targeting the bully victim dynamic so we can try to figure out what's going on so that we can erase it and we weren't looking at the right problem. So when I see when I see a bully behavior now in a classroom or whatever, yes, I, lo I, I notice it, I pause live action and I shine a light on it, but my focus isn't on the bully or the victim. I might, s I might make a snide comment to the bully, but, but my focus is on um, why am I the only person who has a problem with Billy calling Joey a retard or whatever? You guys all heard that comment just happen and no one said a thing and a couple of you laughed. You guys need to help me understand that because I'm pretty sure you guys don't want to be in a classroom where if you make one comment that isn't brilliant that you're going to get called that word. You know you don't want to be part of that. So every intervention now is about activating people to cultivate and maintain a healthy culture. Again, go back to the Southern Baptist Church example. Everyone has to, uh, has, to, has to have the value, everyone in the culture has to have the value that we don't treat people this way, okay? But this is not easy work to do, okay? But we have to do it. When I had, when I had a bona fide bully in my class five years ago and she spent, she's a huge, strong, scary girl, um, she was in eighth grade. She looked like she was 20, um, and she freaked everyone out. And everything, she used her, she used her intimidation to influence every single um, social dynamic she was in. And so now she's in my classroom. And now, after the paradigm shift, I know what to do. And it's going to work. <laughs> and it did. It's just hard work. Okay, so how do we build a culture that, how do we change her behavior by, um, by changing the culture, okay? Because at that point, our culture, it was the beginning of the year, our culture wasn't quite there yet, it's a hard process. So how does this work now? And here's, and here's how it worked. We would, we would give the speech about building a classroom culture where, where no, one, no one has to worry that they're gonna get talked to like this and that, and sometimes kids get it and sometimes they didn't, but here's how, here's how it plays out, here's how we actively build it, here's how you guys are gonna actively um, build it. When we see um, behaviors that are unkind at all, you can call them bullying behaviors or not. Um, bullies, bullying behaviors are a good example of this, but not the only one. Um, and every intervention you do is going to be to activate kids to think about and to build a healthy culture. And it's just like I said, you're going to shine a light on the unkind behavior and you're going to ask kids, what do you guys think of this? And you're going to have idiot kids, I always do, who say, that. there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and it's usually the bully. I didn't do anything wrong. I just felt she needed to know that she was stupid. I was just giving her information. I mean, it's, I've, I've heard that a lot. It's just awful. Um, but you're, so you're going to get some resistance to this whole process. But again, you're, getting, you're activating people to think about, is this the kind of classroom that you guys want to have? Okay. And there are a lot of ways to do that, um, uh, but you get sort of the flavor of whenever, you, however you get a chance. And I work in a therapeutic day school, so I can stop, I can stop academic instruction and have this long conversation. But I've also, I've also been in gen ed, and I've also been in accelerated classes in a therapeutic setting where it wasn't really appropriate to circle up and have this long conversation, but I can still do things like if I hear a bullying comment in my math class, while I'm teaching, I can say something like, you know, I can't wait for the day where a comment like that gets made in a class and the kids don't just let it go. The kids don't just let it happen. I can't wait for the guy who made it to be made to feel like an idiot and for everyone else to let him know that and, and to help out the, the kid who just got who just got insulted. Um, I just can't wait for the day. Now I'm back to instruction. Um, however, is, however is in your scope, in your role, within your style, um, whatever, whatever, however you have access to kids in this, um, you're going to have a trillion opportunities to get kids to think about how certain behaviors impact other people. Um, the obvious thing about um, this hard work is 
you have people at the higher end of the social ladder, as I mentioned before, that aren't as invested in changing the culture because they're not negatively impacted by it, right? So it's hard to get buy-in from kids who don't identify something as a problem. It's sad that they don't identify it as a problem since other people are getting hurt, but when they're not getting hurt, they don't see it as much as a problem. And I know that, okay? We, we, we know that. Here's, here are some discussion points to get, to get ev all your kids, e all kids to buy in into a healthy culture. And this is the only place where social media helps us because even the most popular kids understand the dynamics of social media and that some anonymous person, I don't care how popular you are, some anonymous person for any reason can say anything on Snapchat, Facebook or whatever, Instagram, and, and all of a sudden everybody's talking about you doing something stupid, embarrassing, mean, wh or whatever, okay? This social ladder now with social media, it's not, it's not stable. If it ever was stable, and it was more stable in the past, it's not stable anymore. So one of the discussion points I have with kids who seem untouchable, who think they're untouchable in terms of their social status, they need to know that how an unhealthy culture helps them, hurts them, is if somebody, if somebody slanders them, if somebody libels them on, on social media, they're they're totally, their, their position is totally precarious. The next day, people will be talking about that, and people are going to be saying, and he's going to, this kid's going to gonna experience something he's never experienced before, and he's going he's gonna to go crazy, going to hate it. I want these kids to know that in an unhealthy culture, anyone can get turned on at any time, and this is totally true. We've seen this happen a million times. So as, as I get people to try to think about um, whether or not they should invest in what I'm talking about and trying to be part of this healthy culture. That's one of the, that's one of the talking points that, that I use to, to the kids on the higher level, to the bystanders who think that it's not my problem. Um, uh, this is, um, you guys know that this is everybody's problem. Um, if, we're, if we're saying that the culture is the thing that we need to target in order for these behaviors to go, that you know that everybody in there has to be, um, has to share the same value. So our work is creating an environment to make it as easy as possible for kids to understand and embrace these values. I know this sounds cheesy, but we're going to talk to them where they're at and on their terms, and we're going we're gonna to get them to believe that this is the right thing to do. It's easy to convince the victims of this because they want things to change. Some of the bystanders know in their heart that it doesn't feel right and they want to do something. That was how I was. I, I, I didn't like what was going on. I just didn't know what to do. And it was easier for me to say I wasn't part of it and just not think about it. Now we're giving, now we're giving people, so if I was listening to myself 15 years ago, I would have grasped onto something because I didn't know what to do. I didn't think I was part of the problem. I was part of the problem. No one told me that and they didn't tell me what to do. I would have done something. There, and there, I'm, not a, I'm not an angel. There are a lot of people out there like me who would do something if they knew that they needed to and they needed to know what to do. And even if I'm wrong about that, I don't care. Prove me wrong. Let's give them that, let's give them those tools. Let's have these conversations. The thing, that, the thing about the bullies I'm not worried about is if we do everything else right, the bullies, will, the bullies are smart, and they will come, they'll come, okay? Going back to my eighth grade girl who looked like she was 20 in the classroom. She came in wanting to use her bullying strategies to own the social environment, which sure enough, she did, okay? But we started early and often at saying, you guys hear what she's saying. Sounds pretty scary. <laughs> um, no one's sounds scary that's probably why no one's saying anything to her but but let's talk about this it's the beginning of the year do we really want the scariest person in the room to be the one that sort of controls everything that goes on wouldn't that suck for you guys if you had to you had to live in fear <laughs> of someone every time she's like what are you talking about and i wasn't even talking to her okay she's never heard a conversation like this before i'm just trying to engage the other kid do you should we let this behavior go of hers so that, so that you guys can come in every day and just hope to God that she doesn't threaten you? Do you want to live like that, or do you guys want to do something else? I mean, do you think it's, what do you guys want to do? And a couple kids, you know, with a little bit of, you know, a little bit of bravery would say, yeah, I don't, I think I'd rather not, <laughs> you know, come to a school if I thought, you know, that I was going to get, like, have to be, like, scared of someone or that someone was going to, like, be threatening. Um, and, you know, as, as adults, we're, we're coaching this. Um, 
and I'm speeding through this part of the discussion in the interest of time, but you guys know what I'm doing. We're, this is how we're starting to think about how to create a culture. And again, she's not bought in. She doesn't even know what I'm doing, but I don't need her to be part of this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you how this played out and I'm not lying to you guys um, about this. So that's how the discussion started, okay? That, you know, we s the kids started saying, yeah, I'd rather not have to get yelled at or get threatened every, every time. And they weren't even trying to direct it at her, but I wanted her to hear it and she did hear it and she did reflect on it. Um, but knowing the bullies like I think that I do, and maybe giving her too much credit, her need to be intimidating is all about her need to control her social environment. And if you knew her history, of family history at home, you would know why she has such a void in the area of social connection. So yes, I do feel sorry for her, as I probably would with most bullies if I knew their story. Not all of them, some are just jerks. <laughs> but um, you know, there's, it takes all kinds, right? But at any, at any rate, <coughs> I got you can't just give the lecture and stop. It's such an active process. So for her, <coughs> the other thing that was going on hand in hand, as we're, as we're trying to get the kids to find their voice to say, I don't, I'm not really cool with you, you know, yelling at someone like that. I got the kids to stop laughing when she was mean to people. Um, and it, but it took a while um, for me to get kids to be like, can you just leave them alone? Or to go to the kid, like I said, and say, say if you were okay. It took a little bit of time, but not long. So now I'm working against her behavior, but the culture is being created. And I already see a shift happening because like I said, bullies are smart, okay? If there is no advantage to being a bully, then they'll shift their behavior. And how do we help her through that process? We helped her in a million ways. We set some kind of boundary, the kids set some kind of boundary that I don't like that behavior if I see it. We, we set some kind of boundary where we're not going to totally reinforce you when you act like that. Um, and we worked up to, if you treat people like that, we're going to tell you not to. We're going to ask you not to, say that's not very cool. And we're going to make sure that the person that you're targeting is actually, we're our focus is going to be on helping them out, not you. The other, what the teachers were doing, and this is, you guys can find a number of creative ways to do that. Um, because I was right, and, and you will be in most cases, that she needed, she just wanted power and influence for her, because for her own reasons. There are a lot of reasons why we want this, but the only way that she was good at getting it because of her size was by being mean. That was what worked so well for her. So we set, she had a number of other skills. She was bright. You know, we had her, we had her tutoring other kids. We had her tutoring the sixth graders. I let her lead groups. I pulled her into one of my peer mediation sessions and I asked her to lead it. This, isn't, this wasn't an accident. I was trying to get her to gain power and control in a more pro-social manner. And that was, our, that was our recipe, that was our blueprint in this small classroom, which the, the um, implications for larger groups that are obvious, it's just hard work. And so now she's, we're giving her power and status by doing pro-social things. So she doesn't have to bully for that purpose anymore. The other thing that I was doing, this is a little deceptive, but I don't feel bad about it, is say she would be sitting over here and there would be a comment over here that typically she might may have a bullying comment for. So what I would do either before she could respond or maybe she didn't even hear what was said over here, I would stop and I'd look at her and I'd say, I am so proud of you. And she's either looking at me like I'm totally nuts or she's like waiting she, either way, she's confused. She's looking at me totally confused. And I'm saying, do you know that three weeks ago, if you heard that comment, you would have probably said something really mean and you didn't do that. You are becoming a much kinder person. And I think everyone in this room appreciates that. And that is not a hard change to make given your, given your life and everything. I'm so proud of you. And I don't care how big and scary this is, everybody loves to hear that, especially her, if you knew her story. Um, so now we're, we're doing everything we can. I say it's deceptive because in some cases she didn't even hear what was going on. But do you think she said, I don't even know what you're talking about? No, she just soaked it up, okay? She loved it. So there's, now we're doing things that are even more deliberate at saying in a health, we're kind of, we're building a healthy culture that if you want power and status, you do it by being kind. You don't do it by being an asshole. Right now, where kids are at these days, 
in this middle school, older elementary, early high school age, where kids are at these days, where they're individuating from their parents, and they're in charge of creating their own social structure, they, I'm seeing this with my daughter right now, I don't care how smart she is, they don't know how to create a social structure on their own that's healthy enough where kids don't get hurt. Okay, they're still calling each other and saying, I don't want so-and-so to come because da -da -da, then so-and-so is going to come. They think they're not doing anything wrong, and everybody's sharing texts, and everybody's upset, and they don't know how to do it, okay? Our cult, it, I don't, I don't want to get into a big sociopolitical discussion about this because it's not about sociopolitics, but it's in the Western culture, when kids set up their own, their own society, I mean, if you've read Lord of the Rings, you, I mean, uh, I, not Lord of the Rings, what am I thinking of? Lord of the Flies, sorry, thank you. If you've read Lord of the Flies, William Holden was right. I mean, if they're set up to set up their own structure, it is going to be hostile, it's going to be self-promoting, and nobody cares for anyone else, <laughs> okay? Every, everybody's, everybody's out for themselves. That's a, that book was a commentary on our culture and what exactly what I'm talking about. So we need to help kids, we need to help kids be able to construct this. And as I've done my research in this area, I've realized a couple things. The reason, this is for elementary teachers and parents of elementary age kids, we do not talk about or promote the values that are necessary to create healthy cultures in elementary school. We talk about honesty and we talk about kindness. We do that pretty well, okay? But I'm talking about courage. I'm talking about selfishness. Self selflessness. I'm talking about um, perspective taking. Um, I'm talking about belonging, I'm talking about welcoming, I'm talking about community, I'm talking about putting your own needs in front of someone else, I'm talking about helping out those in need, I'm talking about cooperation, I'm talking about offering peer support. I've been in the school districts a lot, we do not, we do not talk about this. Everybody has a character building character skills program in their elementary schools, it is insufficient to deal with the bullying problem for all the reasons that I've talked about. And I know it. My kids are supposed to be the best school district in the state. And they're not even, they're talking about it in ways that are completely obsolete and don't reflect anything about this paradigm shift. Okay, so I usually don't do this, but my publisher would kill me if I didn't say this. To this end, um, I wrote a children's chapter book about these values. It comes out um, it's going to come out by Christmas, okay? It's called Dodging Drama in a World Gone Mad. It's mascot books. If you want to follow up, you can follow up. That's all I'm going to say about it. But, but what, one of the things that needs to happen for people like myself and adults and educators is how can we, <coughs> how can we start um, to, to equip our kids with the appropriate skills to create an environment when they get to middle school age where the bullying doesn't happen, okay? Um, again, think of, the, think of the church again. How do we get a whole school, how do we get a whole group of kids to come together and share a value that we do not appreciate racist jokes, we find them offensive. We don't appreciate bullying of anyone, we find it offensive, okay? That is not impossible. But right now, we are just getting started about getting kids to even think about that stuff. And everything I want to do as a parent and an educator is to do that. And I'm not a hypocrite. I told you about my kids. When they sit in the back of my car and they talk about a girl who's not, they talk about someone who's not there, I intervene. This is, this is 24 hours that you're teaching these values. And I'm saying, you guys stop right there. Sounds like you're talking about a girl that both of you guys like and you're talking about her negatively. Yeah, but just, we're just kids. Would you say it if she were here? No. Would you like it if the two of them were talking about you like this? No. Okay, well then shut up. Okay, I mean, everything we do has to break this pattern that a healthy culture gets created. And I'll, I'll end you with one last scenario, um, which, is, which is huge um, in terms of how do we build this culture? Because what happens, even after, um, even when I got the paradigm shift and I was able to create a healthy culture in my classroom of 12 kids, which I was able to do consistently through the ways that I was telling you guys, I still had a problem. The reason why my problem wasn't so bad is because it actually made my point for me. What would be happening with our classroom of kids, people would leave 
Um, people outside people would come into our classroom for a class or for something, and they would remark how kind these kids are, how great it feels in there. We would get so much, we would get so much credit, and we would get so much appreciation for that, and that was our, that was our identity. And we were the ones who were called in internally to, to have talks like this. The funny thing was, was these kids, especially, especially my eighth grade girl who looked like she was 20, as soon as they left our classroom, everything changed because the culture was different. And for her and other kids, that other adults in the building, they would go up to them and they'd say, I've been in your classroom several times and you, you never act like this, but in the hallway and in the lunchroom, you were totally like that. I don't understand. And they would say something like, well, we don't really do that in our classroom, which made me feel good and it makes my point, but it speaks to how difficult this problem is. So I went from creating a, a 12, 12 desk utopia, which I was proud to do because I needed to know if, if this, was, this was the direction that we needed to go, and I know that it is, but it means that in any other culture, it doesn't carry over for the reasons that I'm preaching. Culture defines everything. Once they get to the lunchroom, if they're mean to someone, they get laughter and they get high fives and they get status. They do it in our classroom and <coughs> it goes over like a ton of bricks. And people look at them like they looked at me in my metaphorical Baptist church scenario. So, um, <coughs> so that's, um, how do I want to end this? Um, Are there any questions? Um, what the things that I've written and the, the, the things that I've coined that people have liked, um, I want to talk about being excellent at being kind. I want to talk about ambassadors of kindness. I want to talk about extraordinary acts of kindness because what, what we're asking kids to do in building this culture is extraordinary acts of kindness. And um, the last scenario that I have, to, I have to talk about is what I call an ABC conversation. And we've all been there. An ABC conversation, or at least what, this is what I call an ABC conversation, is when, and this addresses... <coughs> This addresses social media, this addresses everything, because I just put up the thing that says, even if you're able to create a healthy culture and you'll see a decrease in bullying, you absolutely will. It's hard, but you'll see it. But in a different culture, you have to, do, you have to, you have to start all over again, which is absolutely true. So the work that we're doing with kids isn't just to be part of, of your healthy culture, it's what can they do as they move on to other things, when they go back home, when they go to the next grade, the next school, what can they do to, create, to help create the healthy cultures and the new cultures that they're in? Because we, our kids weren't generalizing it because we weren't talking about it. So this is, how we're, this is how we start talking about it. And the ABC conversation is a good example of how we, how we, tell, how we teach kids how to, how to transport their good values into other cultures to make them more healthy. And if every single person did what they do, then things are going to look and feel different, I promise. The ABC conversation is simple. Person A talks to person B about person C, okay? And on social media, this happens all the time. This happens dozens of times a day in every social circle, okay? The reason why it happens all the time is because every kid is looking for social connection. And if I can make a sad commentary in our society, for some reason in our culture, we love to hear about other people's dirty laundry. This is why reality TV is so, is so popular here. It's why everybody loves to slow down to see how, how bad the car wreck was if there's traffic on the side. I don't know why we love TMZ and we love hearing about all this, uh, everybody's negativity, but if I wanted to make a social connection with person B, a very safe way to do that would be to talk about person C and say, did you see that stupid comment that he made or can you believe what he was wearing or um, did you, you know, any, this, ha you know what I'm saying, this happens all the time. And now, person B is in a trap because chances are person B is feeling pretty good about connecting with person A, right? Because we're, um, everybody wants to be connected. And she could easily say, I know, he's such a dork, and roll her eyes. And we can share a laugh, and we've had a connection now. And, and 
Really, that's all we wanted was a connection because we were just thinking I wanted to feel connected. We didn't care about person C. Um, person C is probably going to find out about it, and then there's going to be drama and tension, blah, 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 blah. Um, too many, it's too easy for person B right now to be like, I know, they're such an idiot. And we're telling our kids, our students, who are in this person B scenario, person A is the bully in this scenario, and this is a good example of how I don't care about person A. I worry, I want, I, I'm focusing on person B. Person C is an innocent victim. Person A is the bully. Person B is where the fertile ground is. So we're teaching person B, you got to do anything to break this pattern. Because the pattern is, he's an asshole. Oh, yeah, he totally is. We're connected. He's excluded. And this just happens all over the place. And you have this unhealthy thing. Person B, we're going to teach our kids to be the person B that says, I'm sorry you guys aren't getting along. I actually love that guy. I hope you guys kind of work it out so we can all hang out together. He's really cool. Anything, anything other than, oh, yeah. It's, it's easy to do, but it's hard to do because kids don't think about that, and we're not teaching them to do this enough. But this is, this is the work. When we tell kids, here's how you start being, creating healthy cultures in, in, your, in your circles, we talk about um, talking, stepping up to the bully, talking to the victim, and we talk about being a bright person B who says, you know, if think about if every person B online, every time something was said about somebody negative, think if there was enough person Bs that would say, why would you say that about her? I really, really like her. That's, that's not even cool that you would post that. That's awful. Again, back to the, back to the church scenario where they're looking at me like, who would do that? You know, so that's, that's another discussion point with kids as they're moving on of how they can to switch th from an uh, unhealthy to a healthier pattern. This is, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's their worry, and there's some reality. To, there, is, there is reality to that, and that's when, when we say to the kids, why won't they, you know, when kids, this is why kids will say, I don't want to stand up to the bully, and this is why kids are hesitant to, to support the victim, because they don't want to associate with the victim, which, again, that thought alone is part of an unhealthy culture. So if my, if my child tells me that, I'm going to put a little bit back on them, okay? But... That is a reality, and that happens. My, my response to that, because it's an absolute fear that kids have, is I want to, I want to honestly address that and say, say, that could be. I mean, you could be associated with the person, and you could be more at risk. Um, but you're also the person who has made a statement that it's not okay to talk to people like that, and that's, that's what you're telling me you want at your school. So you have to be that person that you want other people to be at your school. And if you're going to get targeted for being kind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that, that, that that's not going to feel very bad to you because being kind is something that should be celebrated. If, if, there's, if there's some lame kids at your school that don't celebrate it, um, I'm sorry, and I'll, and I'll help you depersonalize that because now we're talking about them being a victim. And going back to how we treat the victims, I want to be honest with them of exactly what's going on. They need to do the right thing. And if everybody embraces that, then that's how, that's how this is going to change. They have to be part of the solution that they want. And they, it's hard to hear. And as a parent, it's hard to watch. If, if, you, if they do the right thing and, and they get, you know, I've, I've seen it with my daughter who was so nice and she befriended the one kid that nobody liked. You know, they didn't like, I mean, she was kind of overweight. But that's not why people didn't like her. She was, she's also kind of annoying, but my daughter was just kind. And then kids were excluding my daughter because she was associated with that girl. And yeah, it sucks to see, but she had to, she had to do the right thing. She did the right thing and then talked to her friends and said, I don't want to have to choose to being kind to someone that you guys don't like and, and being able to hang out with you guys. That was a hard conversation for her to have, but she had to have it. By far, yes. So it's, it's a lot of, you know, you get the little group of bullies and the little group of uh, victims, I should say, that, that, that don't get involved with them. And so I feel like that you can cut out their life and make it really the majority. So if you get a couple of friends that are supportive of them, they're going to keep listening to you. 
here's what happened in my classroom of 12, because initially, especially to my girl, who's the best example of this, um, people were hesitant to say anything to her or to, ta or, to, or to talk to her victim for that reason. I don't want to be on the business end of her stuff. But it took one brave person, which your child can be. When one person did it, then two or three other people started doing it. And now, I don't care if these are the lower status people. If there's a subgroup of kids that join together and say, if anyone ever gets bullied, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm not going to worry that, that the mean person is going to be mean to me. I mean, that's a cliche. Of course the mean person is going to be mean to me. I'm not going to take that personal. But I am going to um, create a small culture within a culture that says, you know, so if this happens, I want to defend my, I want to defend the honor of my friends because I don't, I know how that feels and I don't want it to happen to other people. Um, and then pretty soon, what happened in my classroom is those, that group started, that group started to gain power. Not necessarily social power, but they changed the culture. Because the culture, if I, if I'm a good bully, and if I bully you and two or three people say, oh, don't listen to Mingus and they, they sit with you at lunch and they hang out with you and they tell you don't worry about what I said, look at what that does. Look at what that does to me. You took the fun out of my freaking bullying, okay? Um, so this is really, really, really hard work to keep this going. It is the equivalent of addressing the, the drug issue by let's make sure that no kids ever want to use drugs, will ever have the need. It, it feels that daunting, it's that much work, but that's what, that's the direction that we need to go and that's the focus that, um, that we need to have. So from here, in your homes and in your classrooms, the discussions need to be, how do we activate kids and staff thinking about how to create this culture? You know what the signs of a, great, of a healthy culture are, okay? When there's a new kid who comes in and they're, they got, they, they have poor hygiene and they're atypical looking and they smell and, and, and they're new to the school. You know, you'll know that you're, you got a good thing going when kids are tripping over themselves to go to this kid and say, you're new, my name is Billy, can I walk you around, where are you from? Let me tell you who the cool teachers are. We're, no, one, no school is there, they're not even close. So you're thinking about how to build a culture where people pride themselves on being the most kind person. You know, kindness is what gets you status in a healthy culture. So think about how to create and reinforce that and provide opportunities for that um, in your class. We spent way too much time focusing on what we need to do with the bullies when they bully, and we're not addressing uh, the bigger issue. So that's the paradigm shift. Um, I've just created a lot, a lot of work for people, but I hope it's a direction that you guys can kind of um, at least understand. Um, so thanks. And um, they said this was 2.30. I hope we didn't keep late because um,
you want me to share the link with you to it, or what's the best way to, to do it? Okay, that's what I was planning on doing. Sure. Um, so, do you want me to just share it with you, or do you want do you got do you want it uploaded to your YouTube, YouTube spot, your YouTube account? Like who who uploads it? Is it Peg Mannion or who? Okay, yeah, if you can do that, I'd appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. 